Good evening and thank you for joining us today, day one of two of our sports injuries and sports orthopedic webinar series. Tonight our focus is adolescent sports medicine, tomorrow acute winter sports injuries. My name is Matt Wilson and I'm the head of sports and exercise medicine here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, where we hope we are recognised as an international centre of excellence for the provision of sports, uh, sports and exercise medicine. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by my co-chair, Dr. Noel Pollock, who is a consultant here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health and is Chief Medical Advisor for British Athletics. The Institute provides excellence in the diagnosis, prognosis and treatment of sports injuries and illnesses, both to elite athletes and to exercise enthusiasts. But whilst most of our patients are adults, we have started to notice an increased number of children presenting with serious injury following sport. Of course, children are not adults, and so injury and illness prevention and treatment for this population is particularly challenging due to growth and maturation, sleep and nutrition, and the continued education and life pressures they face. Tonight, we brought together some of the world's leading experts in adolescent sports medicine. We have seven 15-minute talks, and all panelists will be at the end and available for an extensive Q&A session. If you will be so kind to put your questions in the chat box on the bottom of the right hand side, Noel and I will monitor that and we'll ask the most pertinent questions to the relevant students, to the relevant speakers at the end. We want you to tweet away to your heart's content. So please be proactive on social media. But I would, uh, I would just say that there is some intriguing data uh, that you will see tonight that's new and unpublished and there'll be a no tweet sign on that. And if you could be respectful to the presenters, we'd be most grateful. Uh, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Scott Draw. Uh, Scott is the current director of sport at Millfield. And as many of you know, he is the, uh, he, he's been at the forefront, the pinnacle of elite sport for the last 20 years with Team GB, uh, Team Sky, Ineos. In fact, I can see the jerseys behind and with England Rugby. Uh, and Millfield School are very lucky to have them. So without further ado, over to you, Scott. Hi, um, my name's Dr. Scott Draw. I'm the current Director of Sport at Millfield School. Um, prior to coming to the school, I spent most of my career working in high performance sports, Olympic sport from a number of years from 2000 to 2013, England rugby, and then with Team Sky, Team Ineos. Um, so it's been an interesting coming into an education and a school environment and particularly an independent school like Millfield with a reputation for sport just to get a really good understanding how the evolution of the sporting landscape is beginning to play itself out in this context. I'm really grateful to two of my colleagues, uh, Mr Aaron Ryan, who's the lead physiotherapist at the school for his con contribution to what I'm going to go through today, and also Mr Graham Williams, who leads our athletic development programme. Um, much of the work that I'll sort of talk about today is really down to the drive and initiative that they've had a number of years ago to put us in the place that we are today. So. Uh, the aim, what I want to take you through today is just understand some of the sports medicine priorities in, in an independent school, um, particularly from a 13 to 18 age group. It's a very high level overview, but just to give you an idea of some of the emerging issues and challenges in context by which we face and the direction we're trying to go, just to give you a bit more of an understanding of that context before narrowing down into some specifics, which you'll come, come through some later, later conversations. So just to sort of start off, just understand the impact of the independent sector has, um, particularly around high levels of performance um, on Team GB and a number of sports. This is just some data from some reports that came together in 2019, but it just shows if we take a look at the Rio Olympics in 2016, we represent that 31% of those medalists actually attended an independent school. Yeah, the independent sector accounts for such a very small proportion um, of the total number of children who are in the education system. And 20% of all sixth form wars are also in independent schools. Um, so obviously there's something that goes on in this environment with facilities, opportunities, training hours, contact time, which does put them in a, a particularly unique advantage when it comes to individuals who go on to represent, uh, represent the country in Olympic Games or also other sports. 
you'll just see on the right hand side some other examples in other sports as well where um, the number of students that come from the independent school sector is relatively high compared to others. So this is, um, without a doubt, there is a disparity between state and independent sector and um, that needs to be addressed long term to provide a right balance. But we think it's important just to recognise the role currently and the number of young students who come through that sector that go on to uh, compete and play this sport at the highest level. Just a little bit about Millfield School. Um, it is a very young independent private school. Um, it was formed in 1935. Um, it was always formed on the basis of trying to be something a little bit different. We have nearly 1300 students between 13 and 18, um, typically more males than females, a big international cohort. And it was always built on that Robin Hood model very much around trying to support uh, individuals who had some level of talent and ability, uh, but otherwise couldn't afford the opportunities. And so the school was always founded on using high value bursaries to benefit others. So much so that in the early years, it was um, excluded from the HMC set, set of independent private schools. It's been very unique in the way it's tried to help develop curriculum around children. There isn't a fixed curriculum in that sense. There's a huge amount of flexibility to develop and grow as a young person. Our job is to develop young people. We are not a specialist sports school, which is what people think, but the school has always valued sport and what it brings for young individuals. Having come outside the sector and coming in, I guess one of my I guess lessons I learned after year one was was what true holistic development is. When you come into a boarding school environment, the support pastorally through that boarding school, I just never recognised or noticed that balance with academics and sport creates quite a unique mix for young people. They call it the Millfield mix in this sense. Um, and it means life is very, very busy. So, you know, you have your friendship groups, you have your stakeholder groups around you all the time. Um, and, and it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a busy life as a boarder, particularly if you have a passion and talent in sport. At any point in time, we'll have nearly 300 students who will be competing at regional level and maybe, you know, approximately 60 age group internationals across a whole host of sports. So there is a big group of individuals here, um, of individuals who choose to come to the school, who love sports, um, who are training and competing on a daily basis um, and have a, an aspiration, a love and passion for what they do through sport. Um, I'm just going to play, actually I was going to play a short video, but I won't. I just want to give you a feel of what a typical day week may look like. Um, this is a calendar, typical calendar. As you can sort of see what happens, we have Saturday school. Um, and there are opportunities to engage in your sport and training and development before breakfast, you know, at lunch times and after school. So as you can sort of see here, um, there are lots of opportunities to engage in your activity. And one of my first observations coming here from from Team Sky and Team Ineos, when I look at the volume a rider may do, for example, and I then looked at what goes on in a, you know, a boarding student who is, you know, talented at sport, maybe talented at music and a talented academic, you get a feel of the volume of activity that goes on. So you could be up in the, you know, certainly as a swimmer, you could be up at pool deck at 5.45 in your first session. You could have a two hour swim, go for breakfast. You then go into your first group of lessons in the morning. You get into lunch times. Um, you may, you know, for example, you may have a short, uh, you may have a PS session, which you may do an S&C during the day if, if you don't have a lesson or you may do something at lunchtime. Um, and you may end up getting back in the pool at the end of the day. Um, you then go and have your dinner, you then go back into your boarding house to do some prep work, you sleep and off you go again. So you get an idea of the volume of activity and the number of transitions. And that was a real eye opener for me because it does place quite a unique demand on those individuals. Um, and that school is six days a week. And then equally, if you're a talented individual and you may be off doing sport outside, you may also be active on a Sunday. I think the message I want to get through is for you to understand the sort of scale of activity that goes on in a boarding school where sport plays a significant role in a child's life. So let's just look at a typical year. That's a typical week. So school typically does go for 30, 32 weeks, um, which means you get 20 weeks off, if you call it that. But we do have a number of sports that pretty much are full time. So we're very fortunate to have an Olympic swimming pool um, and day students will swim here 48 weeks a year. And many sports now, if you're talented at a youth level, I mean, you do as much sport throughout the year. It isn't just that school time, 32 weeks on. That's one of the big changes, you know, the evolution of sport, the investment through lottery funding, the development of systematic approaches to talent, 
the broadcast of money that's come into professional sports. I mean, we now have these systems and structures where you no longer, if you have some talent, just do your sport in school. There are multiple stakeholders for regional coaches, national coaches, national camps. You know, all of those activities that are going on alongside what goes on in your typical school day. Term times, you know, 12 weeks, 12 weeks, eight weeks is a typical balance. You know, as you get into the summer, obviously gets into exam period for many. Um, and if you were to quantify the total load, and by that I mean holistically, if you look at pastoral, academic, sport, those numbers may give you some idea of hours people may do, particularly in the sixth form, what that may look like. You get a feel of, of what's going on. We do have a multi-sport policy. We would always encourage um, children to keep, keep options open. You know, if you are a field hockey player, we'd always encourage you to do something in the summer, even in the sixth form. So there's a balance across the type of things that you're doing um, and because that's based on the literature and evidence we understand about development. The idea of seasonal sports, whether they exist, you know, it used to be the case. The reality is a talented cricketer, cricketer now, the amount of development work you'll do in the winter, leading into your summer fixture period and when school ends, you go back into your county to continue to play. You know, it makes it a challenge. It, the, the seasonal sport context now, I don't think particularly exists for those, those students in the, who, are, who are talented and have an aspiration to do great things in their sport. There are big competition frameworks, so some are in schools, but again, if you partner with um, others outside, so alongside your training, you know, regular time away from school, particularly in national events, you have all your external pathway activity. I described this idea of multi-stakeholder environments. If you were to put a child in the centre of it and, you know, they're doing four A-levels, they'll have a teacher cohort, they'll have their house parent, they'll have their peer group, they have the parents, they have the external coaches. Having worked at the highest levels of high performance sport, this is one of the most complex stakeholder environments I've ever been involved in. So the ability to get um, an individual development plan that everybody buys into um, is, is, you know, needs real persuasion skills, sharing communication to get that right. It is more complex than anything I've, I've ever come across. Just to give you an idea of like, I guess in some respects for a centralised campus or what that may look like, you know, our top swimmers, tennis players, triathletes will be doing more than 20 hours a week. Team sport, you know, athletes 8 to 12 hours, individual sports a lot more. Because one of the things that we're always trying to do is help prepare young people for their transition. You know, we are not here trying to turn individuals into top, top sports people. Our job is to prepare them for their transition. That may be to US, US unis for scholarships, UK unis, and for the fortunate few that do go on to uh, play sport at a higher level that may be into an academy contract. But it's a small minority, um, and therefore our job is to prepare everybody through sport for that transition. But hopefully that gives you an idea of what a typical year can look like. So what do we do when we're trying to understand the whole picture on the individual? And um, I just want to use this as a case study example. Um, and if you just to take a look across the week um, of a senior student, uh, the sports are engaged in and what it may what it may look like for them. So you can sort of see some of the complexities around programming. Um, this is an example with a student that's doing a lot of stuff internally. There may be, say, sport two, maybe sport of the term, for example. Um, and they've got lots of other activities going on. And in this term, particularly, there's not that much external activity. But you get an idea of the, the challenge in trying to manage um, the training and the commitment in and around yeah, in, in and around the academics, but also their interests and where their passion lies. Um, so if we do take a look at that complete picture, this is some data kindly put together by Mr. Williams and his team from 2017, 18, 18, 19, where they, we've tried to historically use some tools to try to understand that load and demand across young people. Um, those blocks in gray represent half terms and full terms. So this is self-reporting. Sort of sleep index, it was done through a tool called Metrifit. Um, and yes, it's gross data, it's done over a period of time, but I think what you can see is over the period of the school year, how that may change, you know, particularly as you go from term one, term two, through the seasons and then into exam period. Uh, but you can also see the impact of those breaks and what they may have on somebody's ability to recover and rest. So you get to see an idea of the gross trends and that how that changes across the year. Um, but also the importance of those rest periods and what they may do for an individual. Um, so you begin to see the big chunks. You get an idea of the macro pieces of the jigsaw that you're trying to play with to support young individuals um, through sport. Again, it's a really messy graph, but um, 
this was done in a particular uh, group of individuals in one of our team sports. Again, just self-reporting. You see how messy it is over a period of time. But just that concept of being ready to perform and ready to train. And again, like you just get a general idea across those school weeks, how that changes. So sleep quality overall will change. And surprisingly, you know, when you're in that, this environment and that scale environment, when you look at it week on week, you know, general readiness to do your best, um, how that may influence in your sport, but also in your academic life and also in your social and peer groups, that changes throughout the year because of that demand. So how do we, a big question, so how do we keep people as fresh as possible all the time so they can be their best? And so we can prepare them for their exit and transitions. So we've put together some guidelines um, which help us work with individual students to get that right. These are based on some of the evidence around there, but help us manage and support individuals in the way we program and schedule around academics. So, you know, general rules they are, and of course you make them specific based on the individuals, but you know, try not to do more hours than age than age, trying to ensure there's rest periods, you know, trying to avoid specialization, no more than three sessions a day, really good return to play structure. So all of that's evolved over time because when you look at the complexity of the environment and how much go, goes on, you know, we need to support individuals individuals to ensure that they can um, continue to develop through their experiences within an independent private school. So what are the things that really interest us at the moment and how does that what does that lead to in terms of sports medicine related aspects? So I'm just going to just share you some of the directions that we're currently exploring, which is to get a better idea to better quantify what actually goes on um, in this environment. So we're you know looking at some wearable technology. This is some from Moki, which you don't need to again, it's you know all accelerometer based. Um, but it's being used to get a really good idea of the type of activity and how active people actually are. So we've been trying some of these tools and methods. I won't spend too much time on this. It was a partnership partnership with University of Bath with Dr. Uh, Dylan Thompson that's helping us explore this. They've done some great work in the state sector and we're trying to pick that up in our environment. Because one of the things that we want to understand is generally about energy provision. If you think about the amount of time you're spending active in your sport and academically, Without a doubt, you know, our feeding strategies need to be appropriate and we don't think they are. We need to find better ways of fueling people for the, the demands of their development environment. And in this case, we're really interested in getting a better grasp of that so we can make more effective changes. Um, so what about what does all of that? That's a contextual picture around what may go on in a school environment. And, you know, that, that will be typical in many other independent private schools, just the volume of activity that goes on, the balance, the negotiation, the stakeholder environment, you know, the scale that sport now exists. And um, what does that mean for us? Well, as I say, really fortunate to have a small medical structure in place led by Mr. Aaron Ryan, who's done an amazing job in the school for the past number of years that he's been here. Um, and this is just to give you an overview of the number of pupils that he may see throughout a year. So this is a clinic overview from 1819. So we have at some points nearly half the pupils will access the clinic. So we provide a triage surface um, depending on what they've been doing through their sport. Now, not everybody is trying to become, you know, a great thing in sport. For a lot of people and the vast majority, it's about engagement with a peer and social group. It's about sport for fun. Which is to say we are fortunate to have a significant cohort that do play at a regional standard. But that is still the minority, as it is the number that plays for an international level. And even a smaller proportion will go on to make it as a career. So we're looking at sport here as part of development, and I think that's really important. So small percentage of recurrent injuries, as you can see here, but hopefully that gives you sort of feel of what the clinic looks like. I'll just share, share this one with you, which is just from one of our sports and girls hockey. And again, um, Mr. Ryan's done a great job over a number of years, I've been able to quantify and understand the typical patterns that we'd see in that sport compare it to the literature so we can intervene. And most of the interventions have been put in place are really just good practice around warm ups, preparation, prehab, trying to manage those over time so we ensure students can manage the demands of their sport alongside the pastoral and academic demands. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I think it's more the insight in that a lot of information we collect through epidemiology to keep good records and that drives our decision making around how we best support individuals in their sports. I think what I just want to do is finish off on this slide, which give you a general overview of some of those sports medicine requirements or and how that relates to some of the bigger picture stuff I've just shared. Um, so typically we'd see more males than females um, uh, end up reporting into the clinic. Um, we do see we have entry points of new students at year nine and 12. 
um, and the gut feel is the injury incidence is always much higher in those. So that helps us think about how do we better prepare them for the future entry. We have what's called the week through syndrome. Um, so definitely a spike in injury incidence every three to four weeks. And you'll see that through the earlier patterns I showed you around sleep reporting, you know, general power outputs, um, other things like school sanctions. So when you get a good picture, there's lots of things happening during that same time period. Lots of factors influence it. Um, Definitely that changing loading in and out of term time. Lots of things going on holistically. You know, it's great just quantifying sport, but there's much more going on. Um, and that's important that we understand the impact of the pastoral on an academic side around the general load. And of course, you know, young people 13 to 18 are going through significant periods of maturation. The graph on the right here just shows you the in typical injury incidents across week of the school year. Those big drops obviously coincide with holiday periods and you get an idea of what that pattern looks like across the year. And again, that coincides with some of the earlier data I showed you. So we've got a good understanding and insight, and we try to intervene on a global scale with sort of general good practice in terms of what we try to do. What are the challenges to all of this? Well, I've hopefully you've grasped the chaotic nature of what goes on. Um, I think also recognise that from our perspective, of course, having every individual child come to the clinic would be the ideal, but that doesn't happen. Um, many children, if they pick up something from their sport, may go to outside clinics, they may go to different situations. And so we don't have a complete picture of everything going on. We have a reasonable idea, but in terms of our data quality, it's not as good as we think it could be. And we'll continue trying to find ways to do that. Of course, auditing, auditing methods are continually changing. Um, but equally, as I mentioned, around our exposure data to truly understand what's going on within the school. Yes, we can get a good idea of what's going on in structured sport, but there's also so much unstructured activity and unstructured play, which is why we're looking at those devices, the Moki device I showed you, or, or any activity device to get a global overview of what's actually going on. Because, you know, on a typical day, if you finish your prep work 7 to 8.30 in the evening, some students are mainly go out and kick a ball with their friends. Um, and a lot of that's not considered in light of everything going on. So we have gaps and it won't be atypical. It's the same across all sorts of schools. And we're trying to get on top of that. I think our biggest challenge is really trying to get a grasp with this holistic cumulative loading. So the, the, the cognitive stresses that come in during exam time, revision time, the impact that that has on sports, you know, if you have um, poor friendship groups and all the pressure that comes on from being a boarding house, understanding that for us is fundamental to making changes to how we better manage um, young people's development through those independent private schools. So listen, this, this is a whistle-stop tour just to give you a general overview of an independent private school, particularly one where sport plays a massive role. Hopefully, it's give you a bit of an insight in terms of the, what it may look like and be experienced for by a student, um, the volume and loading of that type of activity and the complexity of that environment to get it right. You've, you've seen some insights and information that we've been trying to collect over the past few years and some of the emerging issues that we're trying to tackle. Um, it is a challenging environment without a doubt because it tends to have less resources than those at a higher end. Um, but we've been really fortunate with some of the staff to make some progress um, and hopefully let's give you a better understanding of what's going on. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Scott, for our first talk of the evening. A reminder, if you've got questions for Scott, please, please place them in the, in the chat uh, box and we'll come back to them in the Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, our, our next speaker is Dr. Bevan McCartan. Uh, Bevan, is a, a Fulham FC Academy doctor, a Harlequins women's rugby doctor, and EIS sports physician. Uh, she's also chief registrar on the UCLH Surgery and Cancer Board. Uh, Ben's going to speak with us on a common but challenging uh, adolescent uh, presentation, and that of traction apophysitis of the lower limb. Uh, thank you, Bevan. So today I'll be talking about traction apophysitis of the lower limbs, um, whether it is growing pains or whether it's time for a rethink around the topic. Um, so firstly, a slide that you see often in paediatric presentations, um, children are not many adults. Um, the osteoid density of a child's bone is less than that of an adult's. So it's more porous and its haversae and canals are wider. It means that it can be bent to about 45 degrees before it breaks. Um, the growth plates are, um, composed primarily of cartilage cells. Um, and so they're susceptible to both acute and overuse injuries. 
Um, it is the weak link in the chain. Um, it's the easiest site to injure at and given its uh, fragility and uh, elasticity of the bone. Bone is not a static structure, it's a living tissue. It's continually being produced, remodeled, replaced or broken down. Um, in children, there's rapid growth development, particularly as a baby and in the teenage years. During a growth spurt, bones can grow by as much as one millimeter a day, whereas the muscles, tendons and ligaments can only grow by up to about 0.8 millimeters of a day, which means that you've got long elastic bones and then some very tight supporting structures around them. Puberty is a very complex process. Many of the factors involved in the regulation of bone apposition and formation are quite uh, involved, such as lifestyle factors, nutrition, physical activity, uh, biological factors, as well as hormonal factors. So firstly, what are growing pains? So the NHS defines them as aches or pains most commonly in the lower legs that occur in the evening or at night and affect children aged between three and 12. So they're the most common uh, cause of musculoskeletal pain in early childhood. They were first described in 1823. Although there has been extensive research done on them, the etiology is still unknown. The most common sites are in the pay, of pain sorry, are in the shins and calves. The pain tends to last a few minutes to a few hours. Um, they occur towards the end of the day and they're gone by the morning. Joint hypermobility is strongly associated. Um, and evidence suggests that it plays a role in the pathogenesis of growing pains. Studies have shown it to be associated with migraines and tummy pains, which again suggests a connective tissue pathology. There is a genetic etiology with a positive family history being common. And there is no link between foot posture and any other anatomical variants causing pain. Um, there is low level evidence suggesting some uh, pain or somatosensory processing disorders and psychological factors are involved. This again might suggest a link to a collagen or a connective tissue disorder. Um, low vitamin D is often commonly found in these children. Um, the pain tends to improve uh, parallel to increase in bone strength, which suggests it might be a localized overuse syndrome. This has been found on quantitative ultrasound. Um, and also showed that uh, pain lessened as the bone strengthened and the speed of sound was less in areas of growing pains, um, which suggests a bone cycle disruption. Again, you must always think of red flags. So you need to have an awareness of bone tumors mimicking um, these presentations. So you shouldn't get pain at joints. You also need to check for pain that wakes them at night, any weight loss, appetite loss, or pain on weight bearing or any activity independent pain or a very large bump at presentation. So osteochondroses, um, we've got three types, non-articular, which are the traction apophysites that we're going to talk about today. Your intra-articular, which are things like your Perthes, um, Panner's disease or Freiberg's, and then your physeal, which is your um, Schurman's in your spine. So traction apophysitis, um, here you can see demonstrations of um, Osgood Schlatter and uh, Cindy Larson johansson Severs disease, as well as Islin's disease, which is the fifth metatarsal where it starts into perineus brevis. It's an overuse injury where a muscle and its tendon attaches uh, to the area on a bone where growth occurs in a child or an adolescent. Um, the evidence in my slides is taken from a systematic review of all research uh, of the literature over the last 15 years in relation to traction apophysites with Dr. Kush Joshi and Dr. Jane Simpson. So traction apophysitis, what is it? Um, after hearing about growing pains, you'll know that traction apophysitis is not a growing pain um, by definition. Um, it's also not an apophysitis, um, so it, uh, apo means away from, physis uh, related to your physis, and itis is inflammation, and it is not inflammation, it's an overuse condition. So the name in itself is misleading. Um, it affects your secondary ossification centres or your epiphyses. Um, it is caused by constant growth, injury or overuse of developing growth plate and its secondary ossification centre. Um, it's caused by repetitive microtrauma occurring with a lack of a recovery phase. It may be attributed to less proprioception during growth, 
um, and rarely uh, it, it can uh, be attributed to um, altering tendon nociceptors and mechanoreceptors. Um, very rarely you can hear um, that a child falls directly onto the knee, so you can um, have an acute onset or you can hear a pop, and that may result in either a physeal disruption or a, a pophyseal fracture. So diagnosis is primarily clinical. It's important that you refer in early, um, particularly for things like Syndig, Larson, Johansson, which can involve quite complex management. Um, the four key clinical findings with high level evidence for diagnosis were tenderness on um, palpation of a bony prominence, uh, point tenderness over the bony insertion and the portion of the tendon attached, um, enlargement of prominence and also pain on resistance of the muscle groups. So, for example, uh, pain on passive flexion and resistance extension of the knee uh, for Osgood Schladders. X-rays are not essential, but they assist your diagnosis. It's useful to use as a baseline. Um, it will show fragmentary ossification, as you can see, uh, for example, on the left. So this is Syndic Larson Johansson. And then on the right is uh, an extension or a worsening of the condition, which leads to a patellar sleeve fracture. Um, ultrasound is a, a, a good predictor and a tool to use for imaging in the course of the disease. So it's quite useful to use in clinic if you have it. So management, what works? Firstly, it's really important to use um, reassurance. So it's not a disease. It was um, uh, first described by physicians and, and then as such named after them. Um, it, it's individual centered approach. It needs to be symptom driven. It's a self-limiting condition, um, which tends to annoy people by, uh, by saying that, but it usually does resolve with fusion of the physis or about a year roughly after peak height velocity, or for uh, women, you can say uh, that it resolves a year after their periods. Um, firstly, it involves uh, relative rest initially. Um, so you can do light aerobic uh, exercises, pain allows, you don't have to completely rest. It needs to be um, uh, an individual centered approach, as I said. Um, you have to symptom manage, so you're going to use things like ice, strapping um, for comfort sake so you can use that across your tibial tuberosity um, and protective padding during training or um, if playing games uh, all the words that tend to trigger people um, you also need to consider activity modification so ideally what you want to do is 50% uh, of your uh, previous training load as a, a rough guide um, you're going to want to look at any muscular imbalances that the adolescent might have um, again in this uh, particular instance, it's really important to focus on balance work and proprioception and stretching a bit more. Um, you've got some very tight uh, muscles and tendons and some very um, long elastic bones and, and as such, then the proprioception in the child will be altered. Um, it's important to try and mix up training and try and, and vary their training um, and, and concentrate less on sports specific work. Uh, I think Diane might talk, uh, cover a bit more on that. In very severe cases, um, it's important to restrict your weight bearing and uh, particularly initially, and this is going to involve then close follow up at regular intervals. Um, ultrasound is very useful as a prediction of the course of treatment. That in clinic it's easy on hand to have. Um, it's really important to get a surgical opinion or to consider surgery, um, particularly if there is physeal disruption or any apophyseal fracture or if the child is getting increasing pain despite all your efforts. Are there any? Um, so firstly they talk about tight muscle groups. It's really important to look at um, their muscles and, and whether there is a muscular imbalance, you can get um, hamstring or quad shortening. Um, you need to look for children who are particularly active. So this might occur early in season when they've had a period off and then they go back to sports and they have a sudden increase in their intensity. Um, they might be the type of kid that does year round sports. So there's minimal recovery in between. So the kind of uh, kid that's always on every team in school. Um, again, you want to look for somebody who's doing high levels of activity. Um, it's really important to have, take a timetable of their week and factor in all the activity that they may do from their commute to school, to the recreation, to all the sports that they're involved in. Um, then you need to look at uh, rapid height and peak velocity. Um, these are uh, shown to be a causative factor 
although some evidence states the amount of growth that you do during that peak height velocity is not a causative factor in itself. Um, low vitamin D has been shown to come up uh, again in these children. Um, it, it's not sure whether this is a causative factor or it just happens to be an incidental finding. Um, what they have found, however, though, is that it may also um, lower their pain threshold. And if you supplement them, then it's been shown to have an improvement in pain. Um, posterior tibial slope is another thing to look at, particularly if you're doing x-rays. It is only an academic um, thing to look for, but um, you will have, if you have an increased posterior slope, you're, you're going to have an increased anterior tibial translation, and that then predisposes them to apophysitis as well as other problems like ACL injuries. So where do we go from here? It's really important that these kids get referred in and ideally to specialist centres. So what we'd want to be seeing around the country is a lot more paediatric SEM clinics. Um, and ideally what you want to do is uh, have an MDT setting. Again, I think Chris is going to talk a bit more about this in his talk. Um, the child needs to have an individualised approach to training load. This is the difficulty with this kid. Nobody's come up with a great training protocol for apophysitis because there isn't one. It needs to be an individualised, tailored approach. Um, ultrasound is really useful to use as a tool for monitoring disease. Um, and there's more research needed into this uh, issue of collagen or connective tissue disorder because there's definitely some kind of involvement with regards to that, whether it becomes dysfunctional during this um, disease or whether it's a cause in itself. Again, there's a long term needed uh, view needed in relation to sports. You need to look at this child. Do they have talent? If so, um, can you wait six months until they improve or until they uh, resolve this uh, problem? Um, and, and so therefore it needs to be kind of looked at within schools and maybe within the teams that they're in. So that's everything. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Bevan. A uh, wonderful talk. Um, we move uh, swiftly on to Professor Lars Engelbertsen, uh, who is a professor of orthopaedic surgery at Oslo University Clinic. Um, he is head of medical services for the International Olympic Committee. Um, and I would be doing him a disservice um, by not saying he's actually at the pinnacle. He's probably the world's most forefront of uh, uh, Productivity in his clinician, his epidemiological, and his basic research science, uh, with over 500 articles. And we're moving on to uh, knee ligaments, uh, ACL reconstruction. Is it game over for a professional career in sport? Thank you for uh, the invitation to speak about this uh, very important issue. Uh, the uh, is the game over for a career in professional sports if you have a serious knee injury, like an ACL injury. So thank you for inviting me for this. Um, we're going to talk about um, pediatric knees, basically, or adolescent knees. You see a 12-year-old uh, with an ACL injury and also maybe with a physical injury as well, which can happen in this case. So the question is, if you are a parent, Will you be able to uh, ask the surgeon, oh, will, will my son ever play for West Ham or for Portsmouth, which is my favorite team, uh, or for that matter, for Manchester United? Can we answer that question? That's the goal of this lecture. So ACL injuries in children uh, is pretty big in Norway, where I live. You know, I work in Oslo. And uh, here you see a skier with a brace on your, his left knee. He's 12 years old. He has an ACL injury. And the options here are basically uh, um, either uh, non-operative or a surgery. And that's what we're going to debate a little bit. The one thing that we really have to be aware of in adolescents and children uh, is the age, scalp age. And you always uh, measure that. I actually don't measure so much this specific age, but the remaining growth rather than the specific age, that's the important thing. And I'll let you know why that is important. Because the adolescents are not just tiny miniature adults, and because they do have open growth plates, but which can be injured, they do have anatomical differences. You know, the ACL insertion sites, for example, are different from the adult one, and their patterns of activity is very different from um, uh, the adult ones. So uh, uh, they are especially vulnerable to injury 
when they are in the in uh, the teenage. And one problem is the high re-injury risk. I'll get back to that, both for the menisci, as you see here, but also for the ACL itself, which if you reconstruct, if you choose to reconstruct it, so uh, it is re relatively problematic. Yeah. We are really trying very hard to save the meniscus, both lateral and medial. And if you look at your um, screen now uh, below here, you see that if you have an isolated ACL and you follow the patient for 10 years, only about 10% will have osteoarthritis, Calvin and Lawrence grade one or two, which is moderate to mild. But if you have a meniscal tear, as much as up to 50% can have osteoarthritis already after 10 years. So that's a big issue. We don't know for sure if this is uh, for children and adolescents as well, but probably we only have like eight or nine year follow-up at this stage. How can we then prevent the secondary injury, the re-injury uh, or the meniscal injury? And will it be prevented by reconstructing or, nor or stabilizing the knee through surgery? That's a question. The concern with surgical treatment is the growth disturbance that can happen if you touch the uh, growth plate. The graft maturation is happening all the way, uh, and you can uh, be astonished sometimes you see how high up on the femur your tunnel in the femur will go uh, five, six years later. And uh, the failure rate is about 30%. And if you look at the BMJ blog I did a couple of years ago, uh, I told, said that uh, there is a re-injury rate of about 25 uh, after surgery for ACL injuries in children, and that obviously is way too high. So recent research that we've been uh, working on, and we still are working on this uh, in Oslo. Here you see a picture of um, uh, my research center. Um, this is Norwegian skiing area outside Oslo. And right now it's uh, minus five and uh, great snow, so uh, it's a nice day today. Here are the publications uh, that uh, I base this talk on, uh, and I'll get back to those uh, as we go along here. Now, this is the um, uh, ILC uh, paper written in 2018 by about 20 of the most um, uh, most uh, important surgeons uh, or non-surgeons doing ACLs in Europe and in Canada, US. And here you can see that the three advices is. Uh, our three advices are number one, not everyone needs to have surgery. You can cope without surgery, but if you do surgery, you have to follow these four, these three uh, uh, special issues, which may be big for, for the children. And then uh, here is the Oslo pediatric cohort. They are below uh, the age or they are 12 or years, 12 years or younger when they have the injury. Uh, and there are 44 of them. And initially they were given active rehab which means they see a physio, and they're now followed for about nine years, and I'll give you the results of those. And here's the treatment uh, algorithm that we use in, in, in Oslo. If you have an ACL injury, and you do have additional issues, buccal tear of the meniscus, or secondary defect, or a big unstable ramp lesion, you will have early ACL reconstruction with a hamstring. If you have no such injuries, we will go on with active rehab with a brace uh, in any type of knee activity and then follow them. If they then get loose after a while and do have instability, they can be operated on later on. And here are the numbers. So ACL injury, we have started out with about 50 and 46 of those had active rehab with a physio. Only four of them were uh, operated relatively early within two weeks after the injury. And um, our primary aim was to evaluate uh, knee function, et cetera. And the second aim was to describe the uh, complications and secondary issues with the knee injuries. And here you have the cohort, 46 patients, uh, 11 years or, or, excuse me, 12 years or younger when they had the injury. Um, there are 44 left of those, and we follow them until they are 19 years old. So we follow them for eight years after their injury. And then the follow-up was easy that you, uh, you probably use this, uh, functional testing, uh, prompts, and clinical exams. And if you look at um, here are some of the results. So out of those 44 patients, uh, eight had surgery within two years, 16 within uh, later than two years, and uh, 16 patients altogether had meniscal surgery. 
they were about 15 years old when they had their uh, ACL reconstruction on the average. And here are the functional test results. The um, peak torque, meaning the strength of the uh, quads. Uh, the, uh, this is for the hamstrings, and this is the uh, uh, functional testing. So the green is the uh, non-operative ones, excuse me, the green is the uh, reconstructed ones, uh, and the yellow is the uh, uh, non-operative ones. You can't really compare them, because this is obviously not a randomized control study, but it's a cohort. And here you see the results. So, so both of them are actually doing quite, quite well. And then if you look at the KUS score, KUS score is a knee score that we use most, most used, uh, mostly used around the world. And here you can see that the non-op, um, excuse me, the non-op group has a very high KUS score, if you look at that. And, um, you know, KUS score means uh, you're asking them questions about pain, symptoms, ADL, quality of life, and so forth, and they score very high. And here is the um, uh, surgical group scoring almost as high. And if you look at this, um, and you can ask uh, yourself based on this paper here, have they uh, achieved the threshold for patient acceptable symptoms uh, in the IK, IK DC, which, another, which is another um, score? And course, have they done that? Well, actually, only 82% of the patients of those 44 patients reached that level, meaning there's about 20% who are not satisfied with their, uh, with their ACL reconstruction or their non-operative treatment. And then if you look at their activity level down the road, eight years down the road, uh, you can see here, this is the uh, reconstructed ones. These are the non-op ones. Very few have level one. Level one meaning hand team handball, soccer, basketball, floorball, uh, and so forth. Very few of them have that. Most of them have level three, which is uh, much more used in Norway, cross-country skiing and so forth, swimming uh, and so forth. Much pivoting sports uh, eight years down the road. And then if you look at um, uh, this, what happens to them through the years from when they're 12 to when they're 18? And uh, again, this is a group again, same group as before. And uh, then what we were looking for then was to see, well, do they get new meniscal injuries? Um, do they get injuries to their contralateral knees and stuff like that? And do they have uh, malalignment because of injuries to the uh, growth plate? Uh, things like that. And then you follow this, uh, they followed 9.5 years later. We did um, bilateral MRIs, three Tesla. We did long leg radiographs, as you can see here. I mean, the track injuries. And um, when you look at that, um, uh, in young adults who sustain, who sustain an ACL injury before the age of 12, uh, the incidence of new meniscal tears were 34% uh, down the road. So every third patient had some sort of meniscal involvement. At the final follow up, only 57% had normal menisci, but none had developed knee osteoarthritis even on the three uh, zero Teslas. So that is pretty good after about 10 years. And then look at this one. This is the uh, cost score. And here you have again the, the pain, symptoms, and activity of daily life, sport and recreation and quality of life. And this is the normals. Normal adults is up here. And then if you this is the Norwegian uh, li knee ligament registry, everyone having a knee ligament uh, reconstruction in Norway get into this registry. And if you look at the isolated ones, that's the yellow one, isolated ACLs, the combined ones, meaning combined with menisci or, mini or cartilage injury, is the red ones. And um, here you have the children. The, the uh, blue one is a two year follow up, and the black one is the nine and a half year follow up. And as you see here, they are pretty happy uh, in, in the overall, even though only 80% of them are totally happy. And then that's because, um, you know, when you look at the statistics, um, even though this is an average, of course, this is all the patients. And you can see here that some of them have very low, low score on pain and symptoms, and ADL and so forth. So you will have a handful of patients who will not be happy after their, um, after their ACL re reconstruction or their ACL rehab. Activity level, 90% is still sports active. But two thirds, mind you, do no longer participate in pivoting sports, such as uh, um, uh, 
such as uh, soft football. And 50% of them blame the knee, for, for knee issues for that, uh, for that thing. Is it possible to become an elite athlete in Norway? Well, two of them are, one is an elite athlete in hockey, ice hockey, and the other one is cross country skier on the national team. So they, those two are doing very well. The issues are the meniscal injuries. They, you know, the healing potential is promising, but still uh, they are a concern. Good thing is that after almost 10 years, uh, very few had a science of, none had science of uh, uh, arthritis and very few had science of dysfunctional meniscus. And the unknown is that the uh, osteoarthritis down the road, we don't know about that. And there are many issues with this by mechanical things that I will not get, go into. Uh, and we don't really know what is the best treatment. It has to be tailored for each individual one. So future research is necessary when you have a patient like this. We have to have uh, prospective designs of our follow-ups. Long-term follow-up, more, more than 10 years is necessary. And we have to have multi-center collaborations. One center cannot have enough patients for that. Uh, you can do an RCT, just like the Swedish one here in adults. That would have been nice to do in kids, but that's very difficult to do. So we have developed something called PALMI, the um, Pediatric ACL Monitoring Initiative in um, uh, ESCA. Uh, ESCA is a European knee surgery um, uh, group. And here we are hoping to have several thousand ACL uh, uh, reconstructions or ACL rehab patients, and we will follow them for uh, as long as we have to, at least until they are fully grown. And then we will pick up on which um, system is the best. Is it rehab or is it knee surgery or are there specific issues when you do knee surgery to these patients? So the treatment has to be tailored to the individual, just like this one here, a brace on his left knee, a non-operative ACL is now uh, 13 years old. And uh, we have developed, or we are developing a machine learning device, which we can have in our clinic, based, based, that is based on 30,000 ACLs that we've had in the ACL registry. So that's gonna help us a lot. The conclusion here is that uh, you can both do active rehab and you can also reconstruct the patient. In this case, 55% of those 44 patients were reconstructed through those nine years. 36 had a meniscal surgery, and 91% is still uh, sports active. And they have good function with high PROM scores. And the question I posed at the very beginning here, is the game over for a career in professional sports? Not for non-pivoting sports, but the tendency is for reducing the activity level. So um, uh, probably not. Uh, for sports like football, team handball, and basketball. So if you are 12 years old, you have an ACL injury, you should actually think about switching to a more suitable sports for uh, uh, ACL patients, even though uh, you have surgery or without surgery. Thank you for listening, and um, I look forward to hearing your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, wonderful talk. And just to reinforce to the audience, questions for Lars will be for Lars at the end. And make sure you enter them in the chat and all I can screen them in the next talk. And we move from knees to brains. Uh, I'm an adolescent rugby coach and unfortunately have uh, had to deal with uh, a concussed adolescent and the parent watching over my shoulder. And we move to Richard Sylvester tonight who is a consultant neurologist based at the National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery that works out of Homerson Hospital. Importantly, he runs our complex concussion unit at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, where he's seen over 500 athletes and a whole heap of adolescent complex concussions. So Richard, over to you, please. Uh, okay, so um, I'm Richard Sylvester. I'm a neurologist based at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, and uh, I'm going to talk about um, sports concussion, particularly in the adolescent context. So, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about some of the issues around uh, sports concussion. Um, first of all, there's the management of acute injuries. Um, and this is a uh, football match at Tottenham against um, 
someone and it's not working, which is fine. Anyway, this video would show uh, somebody getting a big whack to the head and uh, being knocked out. And um, this injury was, was in the professional game, but um, actually managed quite badly acutely. And uh, the player had a, a bad neck injury, which wasn't picked up until he was taken to A&E and wasn't managed appropriately, uh, which always makes me concerned about what's going on uh, at much lower levels. Um, second point is to avoid exacerbating any injuries. Um, and there's been some tragic cases in youngsters of second impact syndrome, which is where um, following an initial head injury, a second head injury in quick succession has led to um, severe brain damage and death in some situations, an extremely rare uh, occurrence, but something to really uh, make people avoid uh, playing on when they've had a significant head injury. And we also know that following uh, head injuries and concussion, your risk of all injuries is raised for six months, which is something we want to avoid. So as well as those issues on the field, there's many issues around concussion off the field that I want to go into. Um, firstly, that's persistent symptoms. And uh, this is a professional rugby player who had to retire after a number of concussions with persistent headaches and balance problems. But in the adolescent group, uh, it's not retirement from school that's often the issue. It's uh, ability to complete their daily activities, including schoolwork and exams. There's a lot of media concern about long-term effects of repeated head injury and head impacts. And this is Jeff Astle, who died of dementia in his 50s and uh, was felt to be due to industrial causes. He was well known for heading the ball repeatedly. And this has led to calls for action, such as children not being allowed to play contact sport. Trouble is, this can lead to reduced participation. And this is a, a, a nice American football helmet with a pressure sensor inside linked to parents' uh, mobile phone, which alerts them when their child has an impact so they can call the coach and get him removed from play. But it's not a long step between this sort of thing and people uh, reducing their participation in sport, leading to knock-on effects such as childhood obesity. So what's the scale of the problem? Well, it does vary from sport to sport. Uh, horse racing with jumps, very bad. Boxing, pretty bad. And rugby is pretty bad. Um, soccer and NFL, both at the bottom of this table uh, for different reasons. The NFL is because they essentially cheated with the uh, their numbers um, and soccer, it's undiagnosed. Interestingly, you're looking at youth rugby compared to professional, it's a much lower incidence, um, but this may be uh, due to reduced diagnosis, which is shown in this graph. So this is um, the incidence of concussions in professional rugby in the premiership. And there seems to have been a massive increase in 2012 and in 2013. And this wasn't because of any change in the game, but it arose because of changes to the diagnostic procedure and many more concussions were picked up. And I suspect that's similar at many levels of uh, um, amateur and youth sport. So what is concussion? So concussion is um, a combination of symptoms and signs. Here we have the uh, German World Cup player uh, in the final of the World Cup who was up in the top there. You can see uh, lying on the floor following a collision with the goalkeeper early in the match. The story is that at half time, he carried on playing, and at half time, he went up to the referee and asked him what the game was. And as this was the World Cup final, the referee felt that was a bit odd and he was removed from play. And so concussion is, is a combination of um, issues with balance, issues with behavior, issues with cognition, and issues with uh, your awareness and alertness. And they tend to be acutely after the injury, but the symptoms can be delayed, making it difficult to diagnose. What's going on in the brain in concussion? Well, from animal models, we think that there is damage to the long 
axons, the wires in the brain, the brain cells, leading to release of all sorts of chemicals and neurotransmitters, which leads to a cascade of reaction of brain dysfunction. And all of this is on a microscopic scale, so uh, much of it is not seen uh, when we do imaging of the brain at a later stage. What's the management of concussion? Well, it's the four R's, recognize, remove, rest, and return to play. And in the adolescent context, return to studies. <coughs> there are major problems with all of these phases. Um, with recognition and removal, it's a difficult diagnosis to make. Um, when people are not being looked at very carefully with video replays, the observable signs of concussion, such as brief loss of consciousness or poor balance can often be missed. There can be delayed onset of symptoms. And there's really a, a complete lack of objective markers. And much of the diagnosis of concussion is based on symptom reporting, which can be uh, falsely reassuring when people deny symptoms, for instance. Um, there are these uh, very useful tools, so the concussion recognition tool, which is specifically designed to identify concussion in children and adolescents as well as adults, is something that doesn't require medical training to be used, and I'd uh, advocate people involved in youth sports to at least be aware of this and be able to do an assessment of anyone with a head injury. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we see uh, a number of things that are initially diagnosed as concussion, but ended up not being the case. Um, this is uh, again, not working. Anyway, there's a cricket ball to the head there, and uh, this uh, Australian batsman in the ashes developed quite a lot of balance and dizziness. Um, and in fact, he had a problem with his inner ear, he had benign paroxysmal position of vertigo, which is nothing to do with the brain and was very easily treatable. On the other end of the scale, uh, this is the, an MRI scan of a rugby player that I saw who uh, took a fairly innocuous hit and developed a number of symptoms and was sent home with concussion, tendered A&E &E a couple of times with ongoing symptoms. And eventually, when I saw him, I was very concerned. Um, when I examined him, he had some signs of brainstem dysfunction. and He'd actually had a stroke in his brainstem secondary to dissection of his vertebral artery, which is absent here. So bad things that can happen with injury uh, don't often show themselves in any way different to a concussion. Um, I'm going to miss that out. And this is just a scan, which even to the non-neurologist is quite abnormal. This is a, a rugby player that seemed to lose consciousness with minimal hits during rugby almost on a weekly basis. And he had obstructive hydrocephalus, um, where the ventricles, the fluid-filled spaces of the brain were hugely enlarged, secondary to a small membrane that was stopping the flow of brain fluid out of the brain down to the spinal cord. This is extremely dangerous and was quite gladly picked up and he went on to have successful neurosurgery to correct that, but didn't play rugby again. So um, many players in, in the mainstay of treatment following a, a concussion is rest. Um, but in fact, when I started uh, doing this clinic, I, I was quite um, surprised about that because when I see people with brain injury in a non-sports context, we don't really prescribe rest, we prescribe rehabilitation. And indeed, as time has gone on, there's emerging evidence that a rapid return to normal activities reduces symptom duration. Um, and this is uh, the time to return to full sport and the time to return to schoolwork on the x-axis. And you can see that the time to aerobic exercise as uh, that goes up the time to return to normal activities takes longer. Um, so apart from an initial 24 hours of rest, we really don't advocate prolonged rest. We advocate gradual return to normal activities as symptoms allow. Um, the uh, major sporting bodies have uh, quite well validated return to play protocols um, that uh, for the under 19 age group takes up to uh, 23 days to get back to sport. Um, and these are well worth 
uh, having access to for um, youth and adolescent sports people to act as a guide to returning to sport. There are some problems around return to play. Um, the effectiveness of these protocols has never really been tested. They're a generic pathway for a rather heterogeneous group. Um, and there are no objective measures of recovery really used. It's really how are you feeling and how are you getting on when you exercise? The absence of symptoms doesn't mean that your brain's back to normal, but we don't have good ways of uh, assessing that. And there's no um, protocols for return to study in adolescence, and these are often made at hoc. And really, I, I would stress that there has to be a realization that um, brains do not function well after injury, at least for a week or two. And this has to be taken into consideration when returning to work and when doing exams. Um, so what happens after concussion? This is a, a table of um, post-injury recovery in high school and college athletes in the US, a big group. And really the takeaway message from this is that the majority of people recover within a week or two, um, but there is a small group of people that take longer and an even smaller group in this setting of 2.7%, but actually in my experience, probably 10 to 15% who have persistent symptoms after a month and really struggle to return to normal activities. Uh, an illustrative case is a 16 year old rugby player who had a head injury playing rugby with no loss of consciousness, which is quite typical in concussion. I saw him three months later where he had significant problems with his memory, headaches, fatigue, poor balance, uh, he had visual vertigo, which is a sensation of dizziness when he moved his eyes or when things in the world moved. Really marked anxiety and a complete inability to tolerate even minimal exercise. He was meant to be sitting his GCSEs and clearly was struggling to be able to do that. So I think this is quite an important concept. Um, when you have a, a head injury, um, it's not just your brain that can be affected. There's all sorts of other systems around the head and neck and damage in any of these leads to this fairly typical generic set of symptoms that is often labeled post-concussion syndrome, but equally could be labeled chronic fatigue syndrome, Gulf War syndrome, long COVID, take your pick. Um, and these symptoms don't tell you what the problem is. Um, they, you need to work that out. Uh, and in these persistent cases, really the key is to make a diagnosis of what's going on, why they haven't got better. <clears throat> in this case, there were multiple problems. So his headaches were migraines, which are very common after head injury. He had an abnormal vestibular assessment. The vestibular system is the balance system in the ears that links the eyes, ears and brain. And that's very easy to damage in head injury. The brain scan was normal. His cognition was actually okay. His memory was fine. He just had problems with attention. Uh, but he did have quite bad low mood and anxiety. Um, so his migraine was treated, his vestibular problems were treated with physiotherapy, his mood problems were treated with some cognitive behavioral therapy. And we managed to get him to increase his exercise tolerance, closely monitoring his heart rate, and doing exercises with minimal head movement to stop vestibular disturbance. And he made a complete recovery and returned to uh, playing sport, although not rugby, as he didn't really want to, and managed to do his exams at a slightly later stage. Um, a common problem that we see are multiple concussions, um, and there's limited evidence regarding what to do. Um, in my experience, more concussions often lead to more and to treatment resistant symptoms. There's no magic number. Um, it's not as if you have three concussions that you have to stop playing contact sport. Um, but generally, if people have more than two in a year, especially in the younger age group, we consider a prolonged period of absence from contact sport to allow the brain to fully recover. And obviously, there is concern about the long term effects of multiple concussions, but also there's concern about the effects of multiple uh, impacts to the head and body that don't necessarily cause symptoms. So um, I think prevention is quite important. And the mainstay of prevention is education, 
Um, and the idea is if athletes and youngsters know about concussion and know about the symptoms, uh, it will be recognized, they'll be less at risk and removed from play and follow a standardized recovery program. Um, there are certain sport specific things, um, such as tackling technique in rugby, um, that may well be helpful. And there's some really good evidence that um, musculoskeletal injury and concussion risk in school age rugby players can be reduced by up to 50% in a standardized warm up uh, program, um, which may not be the case in the professional game as they are very fit and warmed up usually, but is quite interesting in the youth game. So the clinic at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health uh, has been running since 2016. We've seen more than 600 elite community, adult and under 18 athletes, mostly in rugby, but in many other sports as well. The commonest referral reasons are chronic symptoms, delay in return to play, multiple events, uh, cognitive concerns, and some unusual neurological issues such as more severe traumatic brain injury, stroke, and various things I've mentioned already. Uh, all athletes are assessed by a neurologist and a sports and medicine consultant. Many go on to require additional um, investigations and management, and the vast majority return to their normal activities. We've had a few uh, players who've had to retire, but it's a, a minimal number. So in conclusion, sports-related concussion is a significant problem in all levels of sport. It's really difficult to delineate the extent of any brain injury acutely, so safety first and everything has to be managed as if it's potentially severe. Um, when people don't recover after a head injury or concussion, um, the cause of their ongoing symptoms is crucial to diagnose because that leads to correct management. As time goes on, psychological factors become more prominent and require management themselves. Uh, adolescents may be at higher risk of complicated concussions and can often be difficult to manage for a whole host of reasons. Um, but I think specialist services have a really important role in, especially in treatment resistant, tricky cases. And uh, here's the email for the ICH concussion service. We'd be happy to uh, offer any advice and any help where we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. What a, an informative talk on uh, on a really uh, important and topical uh, issue. Um, our next speaker is Di Riding. Uh, Di is the head of foundation and youth development at uh, Premier League leaders Manchester United. Uh, that means that Di uh, oversees the under nines and under six, uh, under nines to under sixteen uh, age group. Um, those of you who were at the RSM meeting last January, which is only one year ago, but seems like a lifetime ago, um, would have been fortunate to hear Di um, had deliver a fantastic talk on paediatric rehabilitation. Uh, so I'm uh, looking forward to her talk this evening on managing adolescents through their growth and maturation. Uh, thank you, Di. Okay, thank you to the ISEH for inviting me to talk this evening and today I'm going to talk about managing adolescent athletes during growth and maturation. So first of all, we need to understand growth and maturation and the terms are frequently used synonymously, but growth is defined as an increase in the size of the body as a whole or of specific parts and maturation is described as the process of progressing towards maturity. And as we know, there are differences in the skeletal systems of adults and children, and the paediatric skeleton contains epiphyseal plates that generate growth. Bones grow in relation to length by the proliferation of cartilage cells and intercellular matrix at the metaphysis, and the physis cartilage cells multiply and then transform with mineralization, producing new bone. So in other words, the cartilage eventually calcifies and is replaced by bone. In relation to width, the bone grows by laying down bone on the outer or subperiosteal surface, and then bone on the inner surface is reabsorbed. So what is the age of the player that you're dealing with? Well, actually age can mean many things in relation to the adolescent athlete. There's the chronological age, which is the age as per date of birth, or the biological or skeletal age, which relates to their maturation. 
And as you can see, these two boys have very similar chronological age, but that they're at very different stages in relation to maturation. We also need to consider psychological age, which is the emotional, cognitive and psychological maturity. And a, um, a, a boy can reach uh, the size of an adult male during the mid-teenage years, but it doesn't mean that he's emotionally, cognitively pro, um, processing like an adult. So here's an example of growth and maturation. We can see the two boys. The smallest boy uh, is called Scott. And uh, you can see that chronologically he's very similar to the boy next to him, but actually in maturation states, he's very, very different. Let's fast forward three years, 181 days, and you can see that they're actually the same height. And it's actually Scott that now plays for our first team. So the smallest boy has actually got through to our first team. The final adult height at 23 years is Devontae's 1.88 metres and Scott is 1.93 metres. So the boy who was the smallest has actually overtaken at final adult height the boy who was next to him. So how do we classify maturation? Is maturation on time? Is it early or is it late? Well, if the player's biological age is within one year either side of chronological age, then they're with, within normal maturation parameters. Anything beyond this, either ahead or behind, then they're either early maturer or late maturer, respectively. A third of players have been shown to be outside of the normal maturation category, and there are different maturity rates in different ethnic backgrounds with early osseous maturity in female adolescents. When we talk about the adolescent growth spurt, we talk about timing and tempo. So in females, the growth spurt commences around nine, 10 years, peaks about 12 and stops around about 16 years. In males, it commences around 10, 11 years, peaks approximately 14 and stops about 18. Girls grow around about five to 11 centimeters per year and males grow around about six to 13 centimeters per year. We can see on the graph that there's this adolescent pre-growth pre and then the hit peak high velocity. And this is when the period, uh, the period of time which adolescents experience their fastest upward growth during puberty. There's then um, the rate of growth then starts to decelerate. So how do we assess growth and maturation? Well, there's invasive methods such as tanner stages, which assess genital or pubic hair development. There's obviously issues for this in relation to consent and obviously in, in the potential for overestimation. Um, growth plate assessment or wrist x-rays is, is actually the gold standard to determine in biological maturity status. However, in relation to sport, it's, it, there's issues whether it's ethical for age determination due to the irradiation. It's a low dose radiation, but there is still irradiation there. So we don't use that in our club. We actually use the non-invasive methods, um, which are equations. So we actually use Camus and Roach, but there's Merwald equation as well. These equations take into account chronological age, height and weight. Camus and Roach then adds on parental height and Merwald adds on sitting height. Both these equations predict, uh, provide estimates of peak height velocity, predicted end height stature, and then we can calculate maturity offset. For those not familiar, maturity offset is basically when you take chronological age at the time that the uh, calculation is done and subtract it from the, the uh, peak height velocity. Um, uh, value. It's negative if the child is prior to peak height velocity, zero if they're going through peak height velocity, and it's positive if the uh, child has passed peak height velocity. There are some issues with, the, with these equations is that obviously we're taking into account parental height, which could be an overestimation, and biological status. So we don't always know if the, if the dad is the biological father, or we don't always know whether in relation to egg donation, whether the mum is the biological mum. Other issues when this study was done is that it's applicable for more average maturers. And the big one is that it was based on um, Caucasian uh, males with middle class backgrounds. So studies are needed for more ethnic diversity. But what do we do at the club? Well, we do all those uh, equations. They're done by our sports science department. And then what they give us is a percentage of predicted adult height. And we use this as a maturity indicator. So uh, this graph shows that there's the names at the bottom. It's all the age group. And we can see that if a player is blue, then the pre-peak height velocity. If they're going through peak height velocity, which means they're 91 to 92 percent of uh, percentage of adult height. And if they're green, they've passed it. So that gives us a good idea. 
it's not very useful for parents or so parents don't really kind of get that concept as easily. So what happens is the athletic development team, they produce biological ages and these are calculated from the percentage attainment of predicted height compared to that of the population. So they, the parent can know that their play is 15 years, three months and they're an early mature at five plus seven months. Some research that's going on at the club, um, James Parr is one of our sports scientists has been doing his PhD recently and this he looked at timing of the pubertal growth spurt in elite male soccer players and what he found is that um, at 18 years of age all 23 participants had um, attained peak height velocity in the 85 to 96% window and the observed age at peak height velocity was 14.2 plus or minus 0.9 years and he did actually find that that test that we've just done, the percentage of adult height window correctly predicted 22 participants at 96%. So what about these two boys? Are they the same or are they different maturation levels? Well, it depends on where they are on their maturation process. They can be the exact same chronological age and um, height at the time, but actually if they're, they're due to be predicted to be different adult height statures, then they're going to be a different percentage of predicted adult height stature at that time. So therefore, boy A is going to be actually the physically more mature player. So how does growth and maturation affect performance? Well, during puberty, there's a rapid increase in limb length um, due to the adolescent growth spurt, and this can cause a temporary decline in performance or a disru disruption of motor coordination. And this is a period of adolescent awkwardness. And this is when your uh, boys can look like the proverbial Bambi on ice. I like to use a lot of imagery when I'm you when I'm speaking to uh, young people. So here we have Inspector Gadget, and Inspector Gadget's legs just grow suddenly. Um, so we explain to the kids that what happens is, you know, your limbs grow suddenly and your muscles are slower to, to um, compensate. So this is when you can feel tight around peak height velocity. But what also happens in relation to adolescent awkwardness is you get reduced perception, uh, proprioception, and this body map changes. So I explain to them, I get them to put their hands out in front of them and move their hands up and down with their eyes closed. I say stop, and they have to tell me what position their hands are in. Obviously they understand when they open their eyes, they pick the right uh, up, down or in between. And this explains to, the, to them that the body understands where they are in relation to space at all times. This is proprioception. This is how the body has a body map. Unfortunately, when you've got a sudden growth in limbs, the players need to get accustomed to their new body. And this can cause a temporary decline in motor skills. This can cause performance reduction and also frustration from the uh, boys. So we need to educate the player and the parent that this is temporary. So what are the positive effects of maturation on performance? Well, we have strength and power gains with peak strength occurring after peak height velocity in both boys and girls. We have an increase in cardiopulmonary and aerobic capacity, and we have the obvious speed and power gains. So really, early maturers are at a competitive advantage, but hold that thought whether they are in the long run. So what about maturation relative age effect and biobanding? Well, the relative age effect is a phenomenon that suggests there's asymmetries in the distribution of birth dates in senior professional and youth soccer players. And it says that uh, players born earlier in the selection year are favoured to those born later in the year and they're discriminated against. And this has been shown to be independent of the variation in cutoff dates. So, for example, the chronological uh, children are chronologically grouped in the UK from the 1st of September through to the 31st of August. So therefore, the selection advantage will be in the months of those born September to December. But in Europe, the, um, the children are grouped chronologically from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. So the selection advantage there will be January to March. This, this uh, phenomenon is found in achievement domains that do not require physicality, e.g. in academics. And it's often due to a maturation associated selection. Does this happen in academies? Well, yes, Johnson says academy selection is more strongly associated with skeletal maturation than birth quarter. We have had some work going on in this uh, area at the club, and we'll, James Parr again has been looking at the effects of maturation on performance. So he did certain tests, the 20 meter sprints, change of direction tests, counter movement jumps. Um, 
and physical performance in the test studies seem to be related more to biological maturity of a player but not and not the relative age um, other than counter movement jump so the maturation you know is really important so what about if we band players together in relation to maturation rather than chronological age would that attempt to level the playing field Okay, so how we could do that is that we could group players using the percentage of predicted adult height stature and the maturity offset. So some Premier League tournaments and some clubs, uh, we have uh, every few every uh, few, few weeks or few months of the season, we do this. And it, we have uh, an agreed maturation band, say 85 to 90% of predicted adult stature, and those boys will play together. So why don't we do that all the time? Well, actually, there's positives and negatives to bio banding. This is a nice paper that asked the children how they felt following a bio banded tournament. And the positives were that both groups agreed that bio banding created a physically more equal playing field and play was less physically and more technically and tactically orientated. The positives were that they were competing against more uh, physically matched players, but this is the early maturing group, and they find that a superior challenge because they're used to playing against the smaller boys. It limited the use of physical attributes to succeed and control the game, and it encouraged their development of technical and tactical skills. What did the late maturers think? Well, they thought it was a greater opportunity to use and develop their technical and tactical skills because, again, they're used to playing against the bigger boys. So now they could use their physicality more for things like shielding the ball. Negatives, they found the games less physically challenging than the age group competitions because, again, they're not playing against the big boys. Where does this lead us in relation to performance and talent ID? So early maturers actually experience the adolescent growth spurt at a chronological age when training load is lighter and fewer decisions are made regarding retention release, which is possibly why they get through. Differences in maturation statuses have the potential to work adversely against early maturers as they may neglect technical, tactical and psychological skills because they're playing to their physical strengths. And all these may have negative consequences when the other later mature players catch them up and achieve the same maturation status. So what about the late maturers? The little boy there, he's got this subs pants on for his age group. Um, so discrimination against the smaller skeletally or less mature players may limit their opportunities and they may struggle to compete against their peers. This may, means that they may drop out of sport rather than continue until they reach maturity when the age disadvantage is overcome. If skilled players are proportionally dispersed across the population, then it's a flawed strategy to select players just from the early maturing group. Otherwise, we're going to miss these, these little gems from the late maturing group. We know that late maturers who survive these programs need to be talented, um, but they also must possess a developed exceptional technical, tactical and psychological attributes. So how do we at the club manage training and physical development? Well, the coaches play players up and down. Now, no parent comes to us and says, why are you playing my son up? but they can get very concerned when we start to play their, their child down. So this is all about educating the player and the parent and reassuring that actually what we're doing is providing a bespoke programme for their son. We do gym robustness programmes and we have regular MDT meetings. So all members of the MDT are aware of when uh, different players are going through peak high velocity. When decisions are around retain and release of players, then maturation and the date of birth of the player is considered. So what about training around peak height velocity? Well, um, we make sure, again, all the MDT are aware and we have individualised the approach to training loads for um, each player. So what we don't we don't do is we don't say you're going through peak height velocity, we're going to reduce your training load for every player. Some players get through without any growing pains at all. So therefore, um, it, would, it would, doesn't quite seem right to reduce load for everyone. So the key here is to educate the parents that if they start with any minor symptoms that they come to us and, and then we can manage their load. So what do we do if a player has got growing pains? Well, we, it starts with education. Um, we'll give them general physio, so lower limb strengthening, address any muscle tightness and neuromuscular control issues, refer them to podiatry if needed. If they just have low irritability, then we'll reassure, we'll get them to continue training and give them self-management advice. 
if they have moderate irritability, then this is when we may, may need to uh, modify their activity uh, in relation to the intensity, duration or frequency of training, or maybe just put them in for the technical aspects only. But we'll get them back to training uh, pretty reasonably. If they're high irritability, this is when we need a period of relative rest and we use the time to work on other aspects of the individual plan. So what about rehabilitation considers, considerations? Well, everything needs to be developmentally appropriate. So everything from load to cardiorespiratory endurance. So the key is, it's about getting the balance between challenging children appropriately, but not asking them to perform exercises beyond their capability. So in summary, Varying chronological ages and more importantly maturation status combined with a pubertal growth spurt and the potential for adolescent awkwardness presents a challenge to those involved in developing the adolescent athlete. Systematic monitoring is key to understanding and accommodating the differences with growth and maturation and education of the player and the parent is key. Understanding the effect of maturation status on player performance is important to ensure an appropriate appropriate play development, both on field and during rehabilitation. And we know that not every player in the academy will make it to becoming a professional footballer, but we need to manage growth and maturation effectively so we achieve the ultimate aim, and that is that each player achieves their own potential. Thank you for your time. What questions do you have? Uh, thank you, Di. Uh, a reminder, um, if you have any uh, questions for our speakers tonight, uh, please place them in the uh, in the chat uh, area. Uh, and, and thanks to the, the faculty who are uh, very active in, in replying to the questions as they come through uh, live. Um, our, our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Julia Newton. Uh, Julia is a, a consultant in sport and exercise, exercise medicine and rheumatology at Oxford University Hospital. Uh, Julia runs a specialist MDT clinic uh, for adolescents with uh, REDS um, and also looks after elite athletes uh, in her role with the English Institute of Sport. Um, uh, Julia will now speak on uh, the issue of uh, relative energy deficiency uh, syndrome in adolescent uh, athletes. Uh, thank you, Julia. Good evening, everyone. I have been asked to talk to you tonight about energy balance in adolescents. This is a topic that I have a strong clinical and academic interest in. And I'm going to give you an overview over the next 15 minutes and then I'm happy to take questions. Just to go through what energy balance is and energy availability. So your energy availability is your energy intake minus that which you expend through exercise and in the case of adolescents through growth and maturation. And your energy availability is what you have to support optimum health and performance. If you have reduced energy availability, then you're in an energy deficient state. And that's when we come to the topic of relative energy deficiency in sport. We tend to measure energy intake through kilocalories per fat free mass, as this is the most metabolically active. In adolescents, in particular, it's very difficult to get an accurate recording of energy intake. Um, questionnaires are notoriously unreliable and so one of the first things to take home from this is the importance of having a discussion and an in-depth interview about energy intake and habits around eating. It's often found that energy deficiency in adolescence is inadvertent and actually with education things can be improved. So I thought one of the best ways to demonstrate to you the things that we think about when we're talking about adolescence and energy balance. And I thought I'd present a case, just a summary of the things we identified in a case that we're seeing at the moment. So this is a 15 year old who has presented with her second stress fracture. She's a sports scholar and she's an all round athlete. Now going through her history, she's high achieving both academically and sporting wise, and she's very driven. And she has, for want of a better phrase, rather pushy parents. Now, both these are correlates for disordered eating patterns. She's also been going through her peak growth velocity for the last six months. And as we know, that will have an increased energy expenditure and then make her more prone to being energy deficient. She's also diagnosed as celiac disease and actually her celiac was diagnosed after her first stress fracture. Celiac can be associated with malabsorption, which could increase energy deficiency, but also there is an independent association with bone stress. She's been amenorrheic for six months 
and she'd had investigations through her GP that had said they'd drawn a blank. Well, actually, further questioning here, it was clear that her energy, her amenorrhea was related to her energy deficiency. She has a BMI of 17. Now, BMI itself actually doesn't correlate well with an energy deficiency state. It is a part of the jigsaw puzzle, but actually the weight and the BMI of amenorrhea and eumenorrhea female athletes is actually not significantly different. She did have a high drive for thinness score, though, and combined, again, this has a correlate for amenorrhea and disordered eating. She has a history of insomnia and anxiety and has previously been under CAMS. And although this can actually be caused by energy deficiency, even if it's not the cause, it can certainly be exacerbated. She was vitamin D insufficient. She also has a diagnosis of ADHD. Now, this is going to increase her background um, met uh, metabolic rate in terms of how much she burns off. And also she's on methylphenidate and that again increases her energy expenditure as it's a stimulant, but also has the added effect of suppressing appetite. So again, contributing to why energy expenditure and reduced energy intake um, can be inadvertent. She had been advised to trial the combined oral contraceptive pill to regulate her periods. And I think an important point to make here is that going on to the combined pill, one, does not induce menstruation. It is a withdrawal bleed. It therefore completely masked what is going on with the endogenous hormone profile. And also in adolescence in particular has been shown to reduce bone mineral density by suppressing IGF-1. It doesn't have a positive effect on bone health. So what are we looking for when we're looking for the health consequences of low energy availability? The IOC consensus statement from 2014 and the update from 2018 provide a really good overview. Here we're particularly talking about bone health, we're talking about achieving bone, um, peak bone mass, we're talking about injury, and we're talking about the psychological consequences. Many of you will be aware of Bobby Clay, who was the middle distance runner who came forward and talked about her journey with osteoporosis and repeat injury and stress fracture by the time she was 20, having actually never had a period. And talk about injury, and there is an increased risk of all musculoskeletal injury, not just bone stress. The odds ratio for all MSK injury in athletes with disordered menstruation and eating is twofold and stress fractures two to fourfold. Peak bone mass, I'll talk about this further, but this is what we're looking at not achieving because of an energy deficient state while you're accruing peak bone mass. You accrue about 40% of your bone mass through puberty and in girls in particular, you've accrued 90% by 16 or three years post your menarche. Low mood ability to manage stress and increased psychosomatic disorders are all increased in athletes with low energy availability. So this is the um, Canadian Multicenter Osteoporosis Study. And just what I wanted to show here is about achieving peak bone mass. So peak bone mass is site and gender specific. And what you can see here is on the um, is the differences between hip peak bone mass and spinal peak bone mass. So the, at the hip, you achieve peak bone mass at between about 16 and 19 um, at years of age, whereas that spinal bone mass is increasing well into the third decade. The things that influence this, genetics, 40%, 40 to 60% of your bone mineral density is genetically determined. Your endogenous hormone profile, and in particular that related to having a relative energy deficiency syndrome, will achieve your peak bone mass. Timing of puberty, so a late menarche or a late pubertal development in males and females is associated with reduced peak bone mass. Then we have teenage pregnancy and smoking, both as being detrimental. And then exercise, which is really important. Um, exercise is good for bone, as we know, it increases peak bone mass, but not in the presence of energy deficiency. And then the last one here that we've touched upon is exogenous hormones. And we've talked about the combined oral contraceptive pill, but also the um, depo injection is known to be bad for bone health in all women, but also particularly in adolescents. So basically your peak bone mass accrual tends to follow your growth velocity and is about six months behind. And so athletes are, um, young athletes are undertaking high levels of activity on relatively under-mineralized bone. This is the study that I showed before that we did on young professional jockeys. So these are entry-level professional jockeys aged between about 17 and 23. 
And what I've highlighted here is just to show the Z scores of young male flat jockeys. So a Z score is what we use in adolescence and those that are having to choose peak bone mass. A Z score of less than one says that you are one standard deviation between your age, gender and ethnicity matched controls. And a Z score of two, you're two standard deviations below. So 76% of young male flat jockeys had a Z score of less than one and 29% had a Z score of less than two. This is much, this is a much more marked um, impairment of bone health when compared to jump jockeys and to female jockeys. And that is probably related to the weight restriction and the difficulty achieving weight and the unhealthy habits that have to go into that for the flat male jockeys. So when we're talking to our adolescents, what are we thinking about? What are our predictors and what are our risk factors for having a low Z score in adolescence? So if we look at female adolescent athletes with a Z score of minus one or less, this is associated with menstrual irregularity, a history of fracture, a later menarche, reduced lean mass and reduced milk intake. In male adolescent athletes, a belief that being thinner increases performance and a BMI that is less than 17.5. And if you look at cumulative risk factors, the risk factors of a weekly mileage of over 30, less than 85% of expected weight, a history of a stress fracture, and again, a low calcium intake in young men, if you have one of those risk factors, then your risk, your score, your risk of getting a Z score of less than one is 11.1, .1, all the way up to a risk of 80% if you have three or four risk factors. Just to summarise some of the key points around menstrual irregularity and bone health. So up to 22 to 50% of young female athletes have osteopenia and a prevalence of osteoporosis of up to 33%. The studies are really variable depending on the populations and the sport. But the key thing here is this begins in adolescence when they're trying to achieve peak bone mass and they were frequently in an energy deficiency state. And when you go back through the rest factors, the disordered eating patterns were beginning at that time. When you are amenorrheic, 4% of bone loss occurs every year for the first two to three years. And this loss of bone mineral density is independent of body fat, nutrition, age of menarche and the level of training. Your bone mineral reduction is related to the duration of the amenorrhea, but it's only partially replaceable. So they don't achieve peak bone mass. On restoration of menses, then the bone mineral density will improve again, but it tends to plateau after about two years. Exercise, as we've already talked about, in the presence of menstrual irregularity doesn't protect from bone loss. So again, what are the risk and attritive factors for disordered eating that we talk to our athletes about? So in the sporting environment, having a high conflict and low support coach athlete relationship, performance pressure, which can come from home or can come from the sporting environment or both, a perceived advantage of low weight. And in adolescence, having teammates or peers with disordered eatings is actually a quite a powerful influencer. And in particular, if they associate that those people with having better performance. So what do we look for mechanisms and surrogate markers? Well, We've discussed the high pituitary gonadal acid, this is gonadal axis, this is all suppressed, and there are alterations in thyroid function. A reduced IGF-1 and an increased growth hormone resistance. There is hypercortisolemia compared to everything else, and this is physiological stress, and is also high cortisol is has a negative effect on bone, and all of this is in a hypometabolic state. There are changes in the appetite regulatory hormones, and a low energy availability actually tends to suppress the resting metabolic rate. And this is probably why um, we don't see changes in actual weight between eumenorrheic and amenorrheic athletes. Looking for other surrogate markers of energy efficiency that you might pick up on testing or on further questioning, we've already alluded to the psychological problems that can either be caused or exacerbated by low energy availability and also a low ferritin that sometimes is also associated with an iron deficiency anemia. In a lot of endurance athletes, they often have a low ferritin. And one of the things to investigate is whether this is actually a surrogate marker for an energy deficiency state. Celiac disease we've talked about, and there is this independent association um, with stress fractures and bone stress. And we identified a 6% positivity for a TTG in stress fractures with asymptomatic celiac disease. We also check now for, we screen all our bone stress athletes um, for celiac now. 
So this is an example profile for an adolescent with an energy deficiency state, just demonstrating what we talked about. This is hypometabolic. There is a suppressed IGF-1. There is a normal TSH and free thyroxine, but a low free T3, which is metabolically active, suppressed FSH, LH, estradiol, and the relative hypocortisolemia. Now, we're talking about athletes, and some studies are beginning to look at performance outcomes, which is important. The studies are not that robust at the moment, but I've picked two just to mention because of their differences. So elite with gymnastics is a very aesthetic sport that tends to like people to be quite of quite low BMI. And a low energy availability had a negative correlation with competition performance. And then also swimming, which is not usually associated with the same degree of thinness, but actually they do a very high training volume so they can be in an energy deficient state and again reduced performance was associated with low energy availability and also this was identified as being associated with the low tt3 the low igf1 estrogen and progesterone the other um, factors that we've discussed is an increased incidence of illness injury mood problems and impaired cognition they're all identified and also a correlation with poor sleep habits which is important in adolescents so how do we manage these? Well, as I've alluded to throughout, it's all important. It's important to have a safe environment in which you can discuss these factors in, in an interview with the adolescent on their own and also with their family. By educating, you can often correct inadvertent energy deficiency. And actually, the first case that I discussed, as soon as she was offloaded for her stress fracture, there was an education session about energy availability. Her menses returned within two months. Education of coaches and school sports staff, a lot of research showing that knowledge remains low in this environment, and these are clearly key people to improve energy to improve energy availability in their young athletes. We have an MDT approach where available, so nutrition, psychology, medicine, SMC, and physio. This is harder in the NHS than it is in the elite sport. Do the basics, correct vitamin D, magnesium, calcium intake, and protein intake. Avoid hormonal contraceptives where possible. Um, I've mentioned here a judicious use of hormonal treatments. We don't tend to use hormonal treatment as routine in those with lone bone or density. But if there is actually a confirmed eating disorder and it seems that they're going to be in an energy deficiency state for quite some time, then there is a role for psychical transdermal estrogen. So a few take home messages. Low energy availability is common in adolescents. It's often inadvertent. It's just as prevalent in female and male athletes, has both health and performance consequences. There is a need to educate adolescent family and coach in a supporting environment. Do the basics well and evolve your MDT where you can. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Wonderful talk. Uh, so finally, this evening, before we get to our Q&A, is uh, Dr. Kush Joshi. Uh, who is a consultant sports and exercise medic uh, out of Oxford University Hospitals and Homerton Hospital Trust. Uh, he's also the module lead, the paediatric module lead on the moving medicine module. Uh, extensive work in adolescents in high performance sports, uh, Chelsea, LTA, Saracens, uh, Charlton. Uh, so Kush, over to you please. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, today. Uh, my name is Kush Joshi. I'm a sports and exercise medicine consultant, and I am going to be talking about what does future adolescent SEM look like. And I, I, an important point just to start off with is what is sports and exercise medicine? We sit in a number of remits, but for the purpose of this presentation, a couple of things that I want to touch upon are the exercise medicine side of things, which is at both a macro and micro level. Um, but also the musculoskeletal medicine care side of things as well. And I'm hoping today in my presentation, I'm, I can marry up both these things and how we as uh, SEM and how SEM collectively can help facilitate physical activity promotion as well as prevention. So many of you may be aware of this already. Um, all five to 18 year olds should be getting 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every single day. But the international trend is very much, this is not being met. Uh, so in the UK, in terms of the CMO guidance and the latest health survey demonstrated that only 18% of 
of <clears throat> 5 to 15 year olds who are attaining this. And as demonstrated by this graph, through the years, the actual attainment of this significantly does drop. Um, there are a proportion, so roughly 26 to 28 percent, who are achieving the guidance in some shape or form, but they're achieving 60 minutes through the week. So it's an accumulative effect. So that is important to note. So why is this relevant in terms of what I'm going to be talking about? So it is a multifaceted approach in terms of trying to reverse this decline in physical activity that we've been seeing through the years. Um, you know, and from our perspective, absolutely sports and exercise medicine is very much a part, part of the public health agenda of physical inactivity. But what I want to talk about today is around the injury prevention and the proper management of injuries in this age group and how providing proper structures for these age for these ages might also facilitate better attainment of physical activity and all the health benefits that come from it. So I'd like to draw your attention to this next slide. So this is from a survey uh, almost 20 years ago, and there's not much evidence outside of this, but what this did demonstrate is almost 8% of adolescents drop out annually from recreational sporting activities, books of injury, or due to fear of injury, which is quite a significant amount. And how frequently are injuries actually occurring? So there aren't any large scale studies within the UK that I'm certainly aware of, but there are a couple of good studies from Finland, both from 2018, which I'd like to draw your attention to. So the first of this was done over a 12 month period of over 8,000 subjects uh, between the ages of 11 and 15 years of age. And in this 12 month period, at least 47% sustained at least one injury. The graph on the right hand side, which I just also have put here, shows where most of these injuries were reported. And almost 50% of these uh, injuries were reported in sports club. So if we were to break this down, there are probably lots of take home points from this. Are sports clubs or do they already have, uh, well, some of them certainly, the proper structure and environment for sport injuries to be identified? and therefore adolescents are easier able to access services. That is one potential thing. But the other side I would also like to think about is, if this is where the injuries are occurring, this also gives us an opportunity to provide proper infrastructure, not only with what's in there already, but at a higher level, which I will discuss in my later slides. Uh, another slide, uh, another a study also from Finland, I uh, looked at uh, competitive football, so between the ages of 9 and 14. And again, this is a self-reported scale using the Ostrich O scale. Over a 20-week period, 46.8, so very similar to the previous study, uh, reported an overuse problem. Significantly, 31% uh, reported at least one episode of a substantial overuse problem. So this meant either a moderate to severe restriction from any kind of sporting activity. The mean injury time for, for these groups was four weeks. And the final point on this slide is that there was an increase in injury seen with increase of age. So how does this translate to what we're seeing in the UK and for the general population? So it's estimated roughly 8% of adolescents are presenting to their GPs for MSK conditions annually. And primary care is the mainstay of where treatment really does occur when an adolescent or a child has a sporting injury. Now, I the, the next point I put is from a study in the north of England, which surveyed 446 GP practices. Now, in this study, it did say that 58% of GPs demonstrated confidence in managing sports injuries. But the reason I'm highlighting the study is there is a slight, uh, this, this should be taken with slight pinch of salt because of the 446 GP practices that were contacted, um, 53% only responded. And so there is likely to be a bias in terms of who responded to this. Now, within the UK, there aren't really any studies, certainly that I'm aware of, which shows what the knowledge and confidence is like amongst primary care physicians in managing adolescent MSK conditions. But there are certainly studies in Canada, which shows, again, there's a lack of confidence and a lack of knowledge amongst primary care physicians and uh, pediatric residents. And the final point I think is really important, I have taken this <clears throat> from uh, the systematic review that we're currently doing on traction hypophysitis, and obviously traction hypophysitis is a very commonly encountered injury. 
and just read it out, growth related conditions are often self-limiting and disappear with skeletal maturation. Now, if a 12 year old were to present with, let's say, Oshkosh Slatters, and that is the line being given to them, we are basically saying to them, till the age of 18, so for the next six years, you know, you may have some pain, but essentially if you stop doing any physical activity, you won't be in any more pain. And once your, your bones fuse, essentially, you'll be pain free. So are we essentially setting them up to say, stop doing sporting activity because this will settle down by itself? Or the alternative is very often we say activity modification. Now, if we were to place ourselves in that 12 year old shoes, what does activity modification actually mean? And I think these are really important things to consider with our current approach. So as a little summary in terms of what I've just presented, it is very likely that injuries are likely underestimated. So most of the studies we know focus primarily on the time loss from participation. And that's why I wanted to highlight the two studies previously, not only because self-reporting is so significant, but also the, the psychological impact of an adolescent or a child having pain from an injury is also going to determine whether they continue any kind of physical activity, let alone a higher level of sporting activity. Um, as demonstrated by the GP study with regards to the number of adolescents presenting uh, to primary care, it's likely that 8% probably isn't what's actually happening. And this is probably reflective of insufficient participation in physical activity generally. And for the final point here as well, what certainly I've seen from my from going through the papers is there is a limitation of how much we know about what's happening longitudinally in injuries in adolescence and just generally. And you know, I will uh, touch on this point later on, but that really does require us to be doing more research in this area. This is a statement from the ACSEM. Um, and I think it is quite self-explanatory, but any injury uh, sustained is a, one of the biggest risk factors for any further injuries which may occur. And if we're not properly rehabbing the initial injury, that is going to result in more injuries and dropping out of any kind of sporting activity. Um, I put this graph in, and this is a study from 2008, and on the y-axis, you've got exposure hours in terms of sporting activity, and you've got the odds ratio on the x-axis. And again, this is relatively self-explanatory as well. Injuries increase with participation. So if we are aiming for roughly seven to 10 hours a week, as per the CMO guidance, it's likely that there will be almost 2.5 times increase in the rate of injuries if uh, only one to two hours were being attained on a weekly basis. So what does this mean? So if an injury does occur and the adolescent stops being physically active, this will have short and long-term consequences. Short-term may include social isolation, any potential uh, detriment to one's mental health, um, as well as the medium and long-term, which we know from evidence will have impact on metabolic markers, which will track further on into being an adult as well. The individuals are likely to lose the health benefits of physical activity um, and the comorbidities that one is likely to get without being physically active. And we also know that healthy behaviors cluster. So if someone is physically active, they're more likely to be healthy in every other unit of their life. <clears throat> so I've been fortunate enough to work in lots of fantastic academy environments. And I definitely do feel we can learn from these elite sporting environments. Fantastic things happen. Now we might not be able to absolutely uh, mirror it to the T, but there is enough that we can learn from there and set that up within non-elite sports clubs as well as schools to allow uh, children and adolescents to be acquiring the 60 minutes of physical activity every day. Because at the moment, if those structures aren't in place, we are setting up adolescents and children to fail because they're not going to have the support to be getting the adequate amount of physical activity. Um, and so I do see a very much a multidisciplinary team approach to this without over medicalizing things, obviously. I think, you know, certainly primary care physicians are likely to be the first call to call, but getting their education levels better is going to be useful. 
sports science side of things, you know, in terms of injury prevention, I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, I talked about the, the psychosocial impact of pain and certainly psychological input, I think it's really important. And you might not necessarily be able to replicate this absolutely, but even if there's the ability to refer into a specialist sports medicine service, I do feel this should be a template that we should be all aspiring to, to ensure that we're getting uh, our children and adolescents to be actually as physically active as possible. The final thing I also just want to highlight here is about further medical specialties as, as well. And this is, you know, this, this will be a presentation in itself uh, beyond this. Those with other comorbidities, such as epilepsy and asthma, are even more physically inactive. So there should be certainly that input into the centre as well. So uh, the actions in terms of what we should do in terms of SCM and in general, physical activity promotion is obviously critical, but injury prevention should be also part of this. We know that exercise based injury prevention programmes are really important and can prevent injuries in the long term. As per my previous slide, we do need a supportive structure but we should be providing education, not only to the adolescents, but the parents, teachers and GPs who are seeing uh, this cohort at the offset. And we need a lot more research in non lead setting so we can understand what are the implications of this injury. And very, very finally, I'd just like to leave you on this in terms of what we are likely to face um, with a huge deconditioning issue which is occurring in all age groups, but you know, absolutely at adolescence. So this is from the health survey in uh, July of 2020, just after the first lockdown. So 46.8% of adolescents, children and adolescents, were either in the group of getting the 60 minutes of uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity a day, or spreading out 60 minutes of uh, activity across the week. In July, that dropped down to 19%. So that's quite a significant drop, and I'm sure we're all going to start seeing lots of things as a consequence of deconditioning and a lot more injuries. And this really should be our call for action to provide the support and structure to ensure that we are there for, for its children and adolescents once all of this does end. Many thanks for listening to me, um, and I hope uh, that was informative. Well, thank you very much uh, to all seven of our speakers. Just what a fantastic evening this has been thus far. Uh, the content uh, uh, has just been absolutely tremendous for an often neglected population. So thank you to all seven. We will have a very interactive Q&A. Uh, I know the, have you been, uh, you've been typing your questions in and our speakers have been answering them as we go along. And Noel and I have picked out a couple of questions. Um, we will go by, by talk order, but we're going to jump in straight to Richard because Richard has a patient uh, that he's going to be late for. So we'll jump straight into the concussion questions and then we'll go back to Scott. So, um, so Richard, the, the, so the three sort of main things that are coming out are particularly the first question in the current climate is the, the impact of concussion on an adolescent in later life affecting uh, cognition uh, and athletic performance. Your, your views on this? Um, I, I don't think we really know is the answer. So, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about brain injury, particularly in adolescence. Um, brain development is, isn't complete until, well, if it's ever complete, uh, but it's certainly the frontal lobes, for example, executive function doesn't really come online until about 21 to 23. Um, so that there's, uh, you know, if, crucial brain development is impaired by injury that could very easily lead to long-term consequences that may not arise in in a fully developed brain but that's a little bit speculative and i i don't think um we really know uh, and it's it's a it's an area that i think needs looking at much more carefully you know having said that we don't really know about the effect on uh, adults in later life either is the truth. So, so that leads that answer leads nicely into our second question, which is, um, in you know, we're fortunate enough to be uh, an NHS and a private facility, um, but is there an NHS paediatric concussion clinic for complex cases? 
Um, and if we do have concerned parents out there across the country, what can they, where can they go to, to, to get opinion and tools? I, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm a, an adult clinician, so my, my knowledge of paediatrics <laughs> is uh, not very good. Having said that, I, I've not come across any particularly um, good paediatric neurology networks. Great Ormond Street has a good mild TBI clinic. Um, but so again, a neglected, a neglected, a neglected area. area. Yeah. Yeah. And the final question before you dash off is um, your opinions on headgear when playing youth rugby uh, and, and does headgear um, prevent or is there a question on uh, um, predisposes to concussion? Uh, I think there's no evidence it prevents concussion. Um, you know, the, the, the sorts of forces that cause brain injury are deceleration and rotation rather than direct impact in the main. Uh, and there is an argument that uh, it may increase concussion rate. It certainly does in amateur boxing um, and it may change behavior. Although in boxing, it may well be because of um, impaired peripheral vision and knockout punches coming from the periphery. Um, but, you know, I, I think apart from giving confidence to players and parents, headgear is, is it's good for your ears, but not necessarily for your brain. All right. Thank you. I know you've got to dash off, so okay. thank, right. thank you for your time. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 pleasure. Um, so uh, let's loop back in now to Scott and um, what seems, you know, uh, we've had some fantastic content in between your talk and now, but just to revisit a couple of things that have, that have come out from the talk, and that is um, strategies uh, uh, with dealing with pushy parents. Um, you know, we've got ambitious children, uh, equally ambitious parents, We've got uh, teachers that want to maintain their grades that they reflect in. It's a, it is a, it is a quite a challenging environment. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Uh, if I deal with the pushy parents question first, um, I think sometimes that you've got to spend time and effort to understand those behaviours in every individual you're working with. So, um, as a coach, if you perceive some of those behaviours from their parents are pushy in the sense in terms of how they're trying to inform and, and support their child, you've got to really try to understand why that's the case. And you know, that's where you need the skills of a really good psychologist. So in, in some cases, it's just because the parents don't understand the journey of a, of a young developing athlete, that it is highly unpredictable, dynamic, you know, it's constantly changing, and therefore the ability to focus on the long term when the short term is really, really important. And I think once you understand their behaviours and some of the attachment they have with their children, you can better put in interventions to support them. So there are lots of things you can do with yourself, with coaches, with peer groups, with teachers. You know, it is like, a, as I say, one of those complex stakeholder environments, but you've got to understand the reason for those behaviours and the attachment that those parents have with their children to move forward. I guess the second thing around managing sport and academics is you know, at Milford, we, we absolutely believe in that holistic development around academics, pastoral in sport. And as you've already heard from the audience, from, from many of the speakers tonight, the complexities of adolescent development, both at the brain level, body, you know, we previously didn't think about what went above the neck. I think you've got to have a flexible structure. And particularly at Milford, we have a very dynamic, flexible structure to allow children to balance sport and their academics and achieve their best in both. And sometimes that means, you know, the very traditional education structures that exist are probably no longer relevant for that talented young individual. And I guess some of the things we try to do here is create, you know, three year annual pathways, lots of different options that allow that child to succeed in whatever they're trying to do, whether it's a co-curricular in music, whether that's in sport and in their academics. So I think the education system needs to flex to what's um, been a you know, the evolution of a sporting system in the UK for the past 20 years. And that's something we've tried to do here at Millfield increasingly to provide that approach for young people to achieve their best in every part of their life. Because the reality is a very small minority do go on and make those higher levels. And what we want is as many people staying active and staying in the sport as much as possible. So, so final question before we move on, and, move on, and, and that relates to, to a topic that Julia uh, was speaking about was uh, energy. Your feeding strategies, I mean, your opportunities to feed your athletes in school is in set periods. How do you try and get enough calories into your athletes? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 right. It's a great observation. It's one of my first observations coming into school when you look at how busy and active young people are, whether we're getting enough fuel into them. So 
you know, here we have um, a great food provision from a provider um, throughout the day, but we've had to work really hard to introduce healthy snacking. We have a full time nutritionist here and we're looking at constantly feeding throughout the day. So the example I gave in the presentation about a swimmer, where there are opportunities to, you know, to get in enough calories throughout the day to fuel not just the sport, but also their academics and their general life around the friends. So you've got to work really hard at it. Prior to coming here, we never had that resource. You know, we're really fortunate to have partnerships with Liverpool John Moores and call, call on some of the expertise there. So, um, yeah, just feeding regularly and ensuring that children get in the um, calorie intake is not easy. And, um, you know, we're trying to work and improve that. But it's just there are breaks in the day. We have the three meal times in your boarding house. You have opportunities to snack. The opportunities are there, but it's about the education of what to eat and when. Uh, and that's an ongoing process. Right. Where it would be no different to an adult athlete, you know, who, who's got that whole high volumes of activity. Thank you, Scott. Uh, over to Noel uh, for his questions for his speakers. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, uh, first up is, uh, is Bevan. Um, uh, thanks for your talk uh, earlier uh, this evening, uh, Bevan. Um, uh, Bevan's talk was on traction apophysitis of the of the lower limb. Um, lots of questions came through on this one, uh, as you might expect, given the uh, uh, propensity of this uh, uh, these this group of injuries. Um, uh, Bevan, for, uh, firstly, um, a question came through on. Um, do you feel the this the start of menstruation um, has any protective effect on uh, these uh, the development of apophyseal uh, stress injuries? I was just saying, I think that might be one that would be a really good uh, idea for a PhD, <laughs> um, because you've got the sort of confining factors that, um, with regards to your bone health, obviously. Um, estrogen is a very has a protective quality. It's really good for muscle function. However, it's detrimental for your tendons and ligaments and can predispose you towards injury risk. So if you've got a uh, predisposing um, traction apophysitis there, you'd probably be at a slightly more increased risk of, of worsening around that particular phase. Um, once the physis starts to um, fuse about a year after menarche, um, obviously, uh, it's a different matter from there. You've also got your cycle uh, fluctuations then to contend with, with, with females uh, around this um, sort of age and, and around onset of first menarch. So I think it's a, it's a tricky one to answer. I don't know if Julia would have uh, any more to offer or to add on that, but I think it would be hard to say. I think, I think for me, I think it would be there would be a definite risk around this area of, of, of worsening traction apophysitis rather than improving it. Yeah, I think when we come uh, uh, through to, to Julia's questions, we might ask for a, a comment on this uh, with respect to energy in particular. Um, uh, thanks, Bevan. Uh, you also mentioned uh, ultrasound uh, uh, scanning, obviously in clinic ultrasound um, uh, prevalent and uh, can pick up some classic changes. How, how useful do you think it is in, in, in managing and monitoring uh, um, uh, these injuries? So I think it's really good tool to have in clinic. Um, firstly, because um, you can look at your differential diagnosis, so you can have a, a check and rule out things like if you see sclerosis or anything concerning on the ultrasound. Um, then, then with regards to kind of looking at um, at the, the apophysitis itself, it's really useful to look for any bony irregularity, any thickening of the tendon or any tendinopathic changes within the ultrasound as well. And so it gives you a good idea of whether you're clinically progressing or worsening and, and, and what the prognosis may be for that child. It's also quite reassuring for the child and their family if you're able to, to do a real time investigation um, whilst they're there. And it provides some sort of tool of reassurance and you can just reiterate what you're already saying in clinic or it can confirm uh, your concerns around where, where this disease is progressing. Hi, great. Thanks, Bevan. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, tendinopathy uh, in that answer. A uh, question came through on would you, would you recommend treating apophysitis uh, like a tendinopathy uh, and maybe more broadly than that, kind of uh, taking that on to, you know, where is the Where's the issue here and the relative involvement of muscle, tendon and bone and how do you direct treatment strategies to, to both or to all elements of that? I think that's that's an interesting question because when you're looking at the literature already, there's a sort of confining factor in that people misdiagnose or, or um, maybe cause or call uh, traction apophysitis by different terms. So you can you can see sort of tendinopathy in 
adolescent uh, jumpers or tendinopathy in adolescent dancers. Um, and maybe it's not uh, strictly tendinopathy, maybe it's actually a traction of hypothyroidism that these children are going through. You will get localized tendinopathic looking changes um, in relation to the apophysitis itself. So um, I, I wouldn't recommend treating it as a, a um, tendinopathy because usually in tendinopathy, what you're telling somebody to do is um, to try and, and slowly uh, have a progressive high loading of that tendon. In actual fact, if you do that to a child or an adolescent who's got an open and very weak physis that's already stressed and already under strain, and the risk is that you can you could cause an apophyseal fracture. I think, as Di probably alluded to a bit more in her talks, um, what what you're talking about doing is is maybe taking back load and intensity on these uh, children, and maybe looking at concentrating on doing things like proprioceptive work or balance work to try and um, uh, and sort of de-stress that area and allow for a recovery phase to come in. Um, it's not about stopping the child from doing things completely, but it would be allowing time for that cycle to start recovering and allow it to heal. Super. Thanks, uh, Ben, and thanks for your time and the, and the questions tonight. Um, I'll pass back to you, Matt, now, and, and bring in Lars um, uh, as the next speaker. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Lars, I know you've answered a couple of these questions, but just to reinforce the point, um, three questions for you that are, that are quite common. Um, what can we do to try and prevent, oh, sorry, what can we do to try and protect our adolescents from having an ACL injury in the first place? Um, I know you've done quite a lot of, the, of this work in Scandinavia. Yeah, that's because we have uh, lots of uh, ACL injuries in Scandinavia, uh, primarily in pivoting sports like team handball, things like that. And uh, there, there are two things. Number one, uh, teach them how to uh, land on two legs instead of one. Number two, uh, change their faking behavior from uh, a one-step to two-step behavior, things like that. Work on their core strength and work on their balance ability. And, uh, uh, you know, make sure the floors in the uh, handball uh, areas are okay. Things like that. Uh, there's an app made by the IOC called Get Set. And that's something that people working with youngsters uh, with potential ACL injuries should take a look at. It's free. You can download it. It's in eight different languages uh, on the App Store. We move on to surgery. Your opinion on repair instead of reconstruction for pediatric patients? Well, so far, you know, repairs have not worked. It's been, it's been um, you know, research for 30 years, and I've been around that time and uh, no repairs have really worked. Now the industry is trying to bring in uh, synthetics to help out for the repair, and still it doesn't seem to work, at least when you start to do randomized control studies, uh, they really don't seem to work. So, so the answer right now is that the repair is a small option, even though if you have a proximal tear, it is possible and some of those patients will be okay. But in general, the answer is uh, reconstruction. Yeah. May, I may have misinterpreted, but the role of bracing and how long you use a brace for following uh, an ACL. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, you know, bracing is sort of out. Um, even if you have an ACL injury and uh, if you do it, something to it, a surgery, or you treat it with rehab only, if you do rehab only, uh, there's no use for a brace. If you do uh, surgery, the first year, for example, downhill skiing, I use a brace to the patients. Uh, and obviously in some pivoting sports, the first season they're in it, it's kind of a, a um, security uh, thing, but there is nothing in the literature on it. And in general, we are not using braces. One thing though, there are you know dynamic braces for PCL injuries. And now there are new dynamic braces also coming out for ACL injuries. So maybe that will change, but at the moment, now, right now, there is no room for braces. Uh, and then final question, if I, if I just add one on the end there, that's sort of, that I forgot, if I'm honest. <laughs> the conversation between the parent, the surgeon and the child, um, you know, we know ACL injuries are uh, more free, becoming more frequent now in the adolescent athlete. How do you approach these conversations in terms of, sort of reconstruction, being conservative, give physiotherapy a good go for nine to 12 months? 
Uh, you know, um, uh, it depends on which country you are in. You know, I used to work in the U.S. There, all the parents knew that uh, they needed surgery. So it's very difficult to tell them about the, the, the options of surgical treatment. In Scandinavia, it's much easier to tell people to um, have the um, access or have the activity level of the child changing for a bit and then uh, try out a rehab um, uh, focus instead of surgery. And then if that doesn't work, after six months, you can be always uh, do surgery later on. So we are actually bringing, trying very hard to bring in the parents uh, uh, and let them know about the rehab focus. Uh, uh, and even in Norway, people are a little bit focused on surgery, uh, which may not be the best thing to have when you are 13 or 12 or 13, 14 years old. You should wait until you are fully ground, and then perhaps surgery is a good option. All right, thank you. Uh, Noel, over to you, to Julia and, and Di. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, uh, Dai. Um, thanks for your talk uh, uh, this evening, Dai. Um, I'd uh, I'd like to bring you in on the on the concussion discussion. Uh, actually, um, uh, for your thoughts on uh, injury injury prevention uh, strategies uh, to to prevent uh, concussion occurrence in adolescents. I think you're on mute, uh, uh, Dai. I think you're still on mute, Dai. <laughs> Dai, it, it's, it's potentially frozen, so maybe uh, pop to Julia and we'll try and get back. Oh, no, you're on. Right. Uh, it wouldn't unmute when okay. I was clicking. It was doing something else. So, um, thanks, Dai. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Noel. I think, um, I think can we prevent injuries generally is quite a complex question. I think in the area of concussion is just uh, you know, a massive one that's a, a big area for development. Um, Head injuries as a percentage of our injuries as total is, is relatively small in the academy. Um, and I think they'd like the FA have produced guidelines for how many um, heading sessions that players can do per week. So under seven to 11, they've got to do no heading in training. Under 12, it's one session um, per month. Under 13, it's like one session a week. Under 14 to 16, one session a week, maximum 10 headers. So the, the FA are very kind of preventative in that sense. And then the FA produces like the post concussion protocols, but there's no real thing to say, well, we should be doing this type of neck exercise or or strengthening specifically from the FA. Um, so in, in answer to your question, no, we don't do anything specific, but everything is is around kind of preventing in other ways. So preventing um, lots of, you know, aggression in the game, like reducing that, making sure that coaches are aware if there's any, even just a minor head injury, the risk of second impact syndrome and, and to get them medically checked out, even facial injuries, even a push to the back that can cause a, like a, you know, a, a concussion that way. So I think the strategy is more around education, really, education of the parents that if they've had an injury at school, you know, let us know. I think it could be it could be a question that different sports could answer differently. So if you worked in boxing or rugby, I think then your strategies could be slightly different. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think it is definitely an area that'll be there'll be more on this in the next coming years. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Diane. And to to follow up on the um on the on the restriction and the changes on the on the heading and in training, how have the how engaged have the coaching uh, um, and performance staff been uh, with those changes? Yeah, I think I think to be honest, I think they've always been cautious around it. Anyway, it's not like they did lots. I think I think just common sense, you know, they're not going to do a lot with the little kids anyway. So, um, and if they've done heading, you know, one session even prior to all these, they're not going to do it every every session anyway. So, I think it's just it's it's the governing body, and the, we have to follow the rules. And and you know, the rules are there to protect the kids, and everyone wants to protect the kids, don't they? So, you know, we follow the rules. Uh, super, uh, Dai, uh, absolutely. Thanks very much. And thank you for your, your time and your expertise uh, this evening. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Julia uh, uh, now. Um, uh, Julia's talks on relative uh, energy deficiency. Um, uh, Julia, a couple of practical questions. Uh, uh, firstly, on, on management. Um, uh, firstly, how to manage that, um, that kind of comment. 
in the situation of a, a, an athlete or an adolescent athlete wanting to delay uh, or just to stop their period for a, for a, for a competition. Um, thanks, Noel. Um, I have I popped a little bit in the chat about this. I think that the important thing to start with is the is actually the discussions around menstruation and menstrual cycles. And actually, the first thing is to start to get female athletes to monitor their menstrual cycle, to use apps to understand more about it, how it affects them, how it affects their training, um, and if you could there's some very good apps out there the one that we recommend in the eis is the fit our woman one because you can actually put the training on you can actually put on additional things you can actually use it as part of understanding a lot about how you train at different times of the month um, the more they understand if you've got a really regular cycle then you can use very simple methods if it's just delaying for one competition um, but i would never suggest you do it without trialing it first because all athletes can have side effects and if you give them some norocystrone just to delay it but you actually find it makes them feel awful they'll perform worse than they would have done so trial all your strategies if girls are have a very regular cycles and it's one competition you can actually look at manipulating that cycle three cycles out so actually you don't adjust their normal cycle at all you've just moved it um, and to be honest if you've got time and you've got that sort of relationship and that sort of with the athletes i think that's a good way to do it some people do like the pill and I'm not saying don't ever use the combined pill. I think using it within two or three years of the menarche, it has a bigger impact on bone health. I think if you're five, six years down the line, I think it's it's the, the evidence on um, having a detrimental effect on bone health is less. And some if you have a, the sort of sport like, like swimmers, a lot of swimmers just say, I just need control and I need to take back to back pills. So I don't menstruate for three, four months at a time. And, and so you have to weigh it up and you have to have those discussions. And again, it's all about trialing different methods. And for older athletes, um, I think Myrena is very good, um, especially if they have associated painful periods and very heavy bleeding and things as well. But the main thing is to start to monitor, record, use an app, get to know, get them to know a lot more about their menstrual cycle and start talking about it. Um, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Julia. Um, to, to, to follow up on that, on the, the bit about manipulating uh, the cycle um, three months out or yeah. two to three months out, um, how, uh, how reliable do you find that shift is? Does, does the shift stick uh, for the next few months? Test it. <laughs> it's one of those long term strategies. I tend to find if you manipulate two out, you're OK. You can normally then. So if you manipulate the one, the two before the event, then it's normally OK. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's one way of doing it. But I think all these things you need to you need to test. But I agree, it does creep. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Thanks, uh, thanks, Julia. Another. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work in uh, in vitamin D um, across all sorts of populations. Yeah. Your thoughts on vitamin D uh, routine supplementation in in, in adolescents. Um, adolescents, actually, the, the, there is quite a lot of guidance out there from um, the um, from the paediatric endocrinology um, on adolescents. And actually, to be honest, they can adolescents, you can use very similar strategies and often higher than we use in adults. Um, there is it's 2000 units a day is fine. 4000 units a day is fine if they're actually deficient. Um, so again, if you if you're just doing routine supplementation, you don't know their level and you're just trying to assume that they're one of the people who are deficient, then I would always supplement through the winter months. So in this country between September um, and March, um, and I would use a minimum of one or two thousand international units a day higher if they've got increased melanin, um, dark skinned indoor sports those sorts of other risk factors that you might look at if they've actually had a stress fracture or an injury then i would want to know their level and i'd try to be a little bit more specific about how we actually replaced it and then i'd usually use all round maintenance to try and keep their level a bit higher yeah and uh, and you've moved away from bolus uh, dosing yes tend to well you can use weekly i think it's okay but the higher doses that they were using at some point you know fifty thousand units at a time and that sort of thing is is yeah has gone out of favor a bit um again the evidence for why it's gone out of favor is extrapolated from a much older population um okay. rather than actually being related to the younger populations but there is issues around absorption and that sort of thing so you do seem to get a better 
a better state if you can do daily or weekly. Uh, super. Thanks, Julia. And uh, and final question, um, a, a bit, bit broad, broader. Um, uh, can uh, undiagnosed gynecological conditions such as PCOS or endometriosis um, affect bone mineral density? Um, and uh, it might be uh, worth thinking about the uh, uh, the relative energy deficiency and apophysitis within that question as well. Mm. So bro okay. broader. Okay. Uh, um, one for you. I, I think to deal with things like PCOS and endometriosis quickly first is when we're talking about energy deficiency and menstrual irregularity, the menstrual irregular, irregularity is a consequence of the energy deficiency. So we're using it as a marker of being in an energy deficiency state, whereas the irregular menstruation and the oligomenorrhea that you get with PCOS isn't related to energy deficiency, so it doesn't have the same impact on bone health. Um, your someone is oligomenic for completely different reasons, but it's not associated with poor bone health. And in fact, they're often a um, hyper testosterone state. So they often have increased testosterone and P PCOS, actually, which is anabolic for bone. So um, and endometriosis, the, the problems aren't for bone health. They're much more around um, pain and heavy bleeding and other side of things. And that's a different sort of way of how we might actually um, manage them, but they don't have the in same impact on bone health. Is a simple answer. Mm. Um, we what was the other one? Oh, apophysitis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so again, I think in it depends. Are we, if we're looking at the broad relationship between whether starting menstruation um, has an impact on apophysitis or severity, which was that the question, Noel? It was. Uh, it was two questions, Julia. One was menarche and the second was um, uh, relative energy deficiency and that impact in, in terms oh, of bone, bone stress yeah. and bone, bone health. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in terms of menarche, in terms of the menarche, what you have to remember is the menarche is usually at a time of peak growth velocity. So again, it's you're probably looking at it as more of a marker of the fact that they're at a vulnerable time anyway. And your bone mineral density, as I sort of mentioned before, tends to accrue about six to 12 months behind your peak growth velocity. So at the period of time when girls are getting their periods um, or boys or girls are at their peak growth velocity, their bone density is relatively, un they're relatively under mineralized. So they're actually at an increased risk of injury anyway. So from bone, from a bone point of view. So if you think about it from that point of view, I think they are a bit more vulnerable. But it's not actually related to the menstruation. It's more what that's a marker of. Um, with regards to the bone health and the energy deficiency, um, there is no research out there to see whether or not an energy deficiency state in, in, has any impact on the severity of apophysitis. Um, but I would just say in the same way that if you had any other markers of poor bone health, you could imagine it might actually increase the bone edema or the bone stress reaction to that traction apophysitis that you would get would be my feeling from experience, but there isn't any research there that I'm aware of. Yeah, I agree. But, yeah. Uh, brilliant, uh, Julia. Uh, thanks so much. Lots of uh, really practical uh, tips there in, in, in managing adolescent athletes. Thank you so much. Um, I'll pass you back to Matt and, uh, and bring in Kush. Thank you, Noel. Uh, so, final couple of questions before we wrap up for the evening. And for Kush, I mean, in this pandemic now, uh, adolescent sports medicine was woefully neglected pre-pandemic, likely to be exaggerated now in physical activity level during the pandemic. What's the role of adolescent? What's the role of sports medicine now in trying to get these adolescents back up um, uh, into physical activity? So. You know, as per the beginning of my presentation, you know, we, we work in two remits. One, one side of it is the musculoskeletal health of adult uh, for adolescents, but then the other side is also just kind of physical activity promotion. I think the importance, you know, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the importance of physical activity, especially whilst these lockdowns are occurring, etc. because adolescents are becoming deconditioned, um, you know, very anecdotally, it's, you know, it's certainly in our, in our clinic in Oxford, we are seeing some very, very bizarre things, you know, seeing people ruin with a number of, I can see Julia laughing as well, uh, but with a number of different traction of homicides, loss of proximal control, seeing that in adults and adolescents. So first and foremost, I think just awareness that we do actually exist as a, as a specialty and the kind of role that we can bring within the NHS, I think is really, really important. Um, this is where webinars like this are absolutely fantastic, but it's not only converted the preacher, you know, in terms of who's here already, but kind of getting that message 
beyond the remit of whoever is here. Um, because for the vast majority of things, especially in this age group, um, they can be managed in a conservative way with proper rehabilitation and surgery really should be a last option. Um, so firstly, that kind of that knowledge base, that awareness. All of right, so you just muted now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sorry. That's all. <laughs> um, so firstly, that it's around that. But then, you know, can we bring this more to schools? Can we bring those education pieces more to, you know, frontline schools within the NHS remit, make that awareness there, and then almost, you know, you can provide local centres or whatever it might be. But then that's going to bring another question. We need more training numbers for SCM. And yeah. so it needs the Department of Health and Health England, uh, you know, uh, we, we just need more of us around so we can actually be there on the front line as it were great and i think that's a perfect uh, note to finish on this evening um thank you to all of our delegates that registered and attended this evening attended this evening. thank you to all of our speakers seven wonderful talks we've recorded them they're going to be up online soon uh, uh, please follow us at the isch.co.uk uh, this is day one of a two-day series. Tomorrow is acute winter sports injuries. There's still time to register for tomorrow night's webinar. Thank you very much. Have a great evening all.